Oh. Kia ora, Councillor Weatherall.
sound booth. So, at this point, I'll welcome you all here for this meeting of the Dunedin City Council. And uh, we'll open the meeting uh, with a prayer by Mohammed Rizwan on behalf of the Muslim community. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon you all. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak tayaz al-jalali wal-ikram. Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'u wa rizqan tayyibah wa amalan tumtaqabbala. Bismillah al-ladhi la yadhurru ma'a ismihi shayun fi al-ardi wa la fi al-samai wa huwa samiyu al-alim. Hasbuna Allah wa ni'ma al-wakil. Rabbana atina fi al-dunya hasnatu wa fi al-akhirati hasnatu wa qina azab al-nar. Allahumma inni ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ba'adatik. Allahumma innaka khalakta nafsi wa anta tawfaha laka mima mamataha wa mahyaha. In ahyaytaha fahfadha wa in amattaha faqfil laha. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-afiyah. اللهم رب السماوات السبع ورب العرش العظيم ربنا ورب كل شيء فالق الحب والنور ومنزل التوراة والإنجيل والفرقان أعوذ بك من شر كل شيء أنت آخذ بناسية اللهم أنت الأول فليس قبلك شيء وأنت الآخر فليس بعدك شيء وأنت الظاهر فليس فوقك شيء وأنت الباطن فليس دونك شيء اقضي عنا الدين وأغننا من الفقر اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الهم والحزن والعجر والكسر والبخل والجبن والضلع الدين وغلبة الرجال الحمد لله الذي بنعمة تتم الصالحات Allah, you are a salam, the source of peace, and from you is all peace. Blessed are you, O possessor of majesty and honor. Allah, we ask you for knowledge which is beneficial, and sustenance which is good, and deeds which are acceptable. In the name of Allah, with whose name nothing is harmed on earth nor in the heavens, and he is the all-seeing, the all-knowing. Allah is sufficient for us in how fine a trustee he is. Our Lord, grant us the best in this life and the best in the next life and protect us from the punishment of the fire. Allah, help us to remember you, to thank you and to worship you in the best of manner. Oh Allah, verily you have created our soul and you shall take its life. To you belong its life and death. If you should keep our soul alive, then protect it. And if you should take its life, then forgive it. O oh Allah, we ask you to grant us good health. O oh Allah, Lord of the seven heavens and the exalted throne, our Lord and the Lord of things, splitter of the seed and the dead stone, revealer of the Torah, the Gospel and the Quran, I take refuge in you from the evil of all things. You shall cease by the forelock. O oh Allah, you are the first, so there is nothing before you, and you are the last, so there is nothing after you. You are the most high, so there is nothing above you, and you are the most near, so there is nothing near than you. Settle our debt for us and spare us from poverty. O oh Allah, take refuge in you from anxiety and sorrow, weakness and laziness, miseryness and cowardice, the burden of debts and from being overpowered by men. All praises for Allah, by whose favor good works are accomplished. O oh Allah, support us and help us, and do not let others overpower us. Guide us and make the following of your commands easy for us. O oh Allah, inspire us with good conduct and save us from the evil of our selfishness. O oh Allah, we ask you to guide us to the doing of good deeds and abstaining from bad deeds and forgive us and show mercy to us. O oh Allah, we seek refuge in you against difficulties, calamities, troubles, oppression, and the ridicule of enemies. O oh Allah, grant us increase and not decrease, honor and not dishonor. Give us your favors and do not deprive us. O oh Allah, grant us the best of outcomes in all our affairs and save us from disgrace in this world and from punishment in the hereafter. O oh Allah, have mercy upon us all. O oh Allah, grant us a life, life of piety and abstinence and guide us all to the straight path. O oh Allah, grant our country, New Zealand, peace, security and protect it and its people from all evils. O oh Allah, grant the entire world peace, security and prosperity. God defend our free land. God defend New Zealand. 
wal asr innal insana lafi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil haqq wa tawasaw bis sabr but the passage of time surely the humanity is in grave loss except those who have faith do good and urge each other to the truth and advise each other to patience amen thank you I'll now pass to Councillor Gary, who has a, a note of remembrance about a prominent member of our community. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor, for indulging me. I just wanted to acknowledge the passing of Mr Graham Burns on Friday. Graham was the gentleman who led the Taroni project and chaired the committee over many years. He was involved in the project, I believe, for around 40 years. His family had a crib at, have a crib at Harrington Point. Um, and he was a gentleman uh, and unwavering in his commitment to the project. Um, we are all so glad that he lived to see the project completed. Um, and at his funeral on Tuesday, many of the cribbies who have cribs down at Harrington Point will attend. And in the meantime, all of the many flag poles are at half mast as a mark of respect. Um, and so I had the uh, opportunity to go, last time I mentioned Graham, to the hospital and visit him and to meet with his family and acknowledge his service to the city in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have a one speaker for public forum, Mr James Cockle, on behalf of Climate Liberation Aotearoa. Kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, my name is James Cockle and I'm speaking on behalf of Climate Liberation Aotearoa. I'm here today to ask you to start counting emissions from cruise ships and stop ratepayer subsidies to them. These luxury emissions are contributing to climate change. One of this lead country's leading climate scientists and member of the Climate Change Commission, Professor James Renwick, was interviewed on Otago Access Radio just last year. And he said this, if we do nothing and we let the warming get to three or four degrees, well, that's pretty much the end of civilization and the end of the economy. According to Climate Action Tracker, New Zealand's action and policies are in line with reaching three to four degrees, exactly the range expressed in Professor Renwick's warning. I want to deal with the idea that cruise ships bring some benefits because actually the exact opposite is the case. Despite being 9% of international tourist numbers, cruise ships contribute only 3% to total international tourist spend. So cruise ship passengers are dramatically underspending in terms of their contribution to the economy compared to the alternative when tourists choose to fly in instead. Cruise ship tourists are economically the worst tourists for us. So they don't benefit us, but what's wrong with cruise ships? Otago University academic Dr Inga Smith calculated that a cruise ship holiday to New Zealand emits four times the greenhouse gas emissions than an equivalent holiday flying and staying in hotels. She says, from a climate change perspective, going on a cruise ship is one of the worst holidays that you can take. The cruise ship industry that is polluting it is that polluting that climate activists like me would actually encourage people to fly instead. Cruise ships cause other air pollution too. The heavy fuel oil that they burn puts um, ultra-fine small particles into the air. These are carcinogenic. Now, in terms of um, these polluting small particles, one cruise ship is actually equivalent to one million cars. And these particles are very small, like they're mostly invisible, so we don't think about it. But the cost we are paying is very, very real in terms of the cost is paid when people die from cancer. According to a peer-reviewed study, the Marine po Policy Journal, uh, in the Marine Policy Journal, sorry, cruise ships are responsible for a quarter of all ocean waste, despite being only 1% of the merchant fleet. The amount of water taken by Port Otago from the Port Chalmers area can increase tenfold from around 2% to between 20 to 30% when they provide water to cruise ships. In summary, 
Not only do cruise ships bring us no benefits, but they are contributing to climate chaos. They are killing people with air pollution, they trash our oceans, they take more water than we can afford, and their working conditions have been described in some cases to be as bad as semi-slavery. We request that cruise ship emissions be counted in Dunedin's total emissions and be included in our emissions reduction plan. The idea that we, can, we can't count emissions because of data difficulties is frankly ridiculous. Christchurch is counting cruise ship emissions. If they can do it, so can we. We acknowledge that taking action on climate change can be hard, especially with a government which has demonstrated hostility towards climate action through its policies. But this is not a reason to stop acting, however. Declarations of climate emergency and the nuclear free movement um, both work like this, with local government taking the lead. Ratepayer money is used to subsidise rail excursions, which are heavily used by cruise ship passengers. And in 2022 to 23 season, it was estimated that that subsidy alone came to $786,000. We are paying ratepayers money to subsidise rich countries that are net negative for us environmentally and economically and it's time to stop. In summary, what we want you to do is to count cruise ship emissions now in the city's climate targets. The statistics might be estimates, they're not perfect, but the risks of inaction are far greater. We also want you to actually put in a real plan, a serious plan to address these emissions with the first steps of stopping all the subsidies. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Well timed, Mr Cockle. Uh, yes, we have a question from Councillor Vandervis to start. Why would we count cruise ship emissions here in Dunedin when, as you've already said, Christchurch is already counting the cruise ship emissions and they're the same cruise ships? I mean, why would we spend ratepayer money uh, on employing somebody to count emissions for the cruise ships that are here when they're the same ones and it's already been done in Christchurch? Thank you for that question. The way that the Christchurch is, is counting their emissions, as I understand it, is, is their portion of the emissions. So they're doing their bit. We need to start doing our bit by counting our portion of those emissions. If we then can charge them for those emissions, we can, we can, we can include that in the cost. We can take that money back. Are you suggesting that the emissions of a cruise ship in our port are different from the emissions of a cruise ship in Christchurch? Surely it's the same cruise ship and surely uh, we don't have to spend the money and time counting them here when they have already counted them for us. Absolutely, we, we can save money by, by using their, um, their numbers. But we still, need to, we still need to account for them. So although, you know, if they've got a good method of counting them, we should use that, absolutely. But, but what I'm talking about is accounting for them, you know, in our, in our budgets and in our targets and ensuring that they're paid for. They're going out into the atmosphere. We can't just put our heads in the sand and pretend that they don't exist. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thanks, James, for coming in. A um, couple of questions. Firstly, um, you'll be aware of the movements around the world. I mean, places like Venice, where there's a big backlash to cruise ships, um, and many other cities now have instigated uh, quite a, what is quite a large user tax per passenger. Um, to be used for other investments uh, in such a rail, for example. Um, would you support um, us looking to do something similar here? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that, that money could be then spent. It could be a win-win for us in Dunedin. We could stop subsidising them, take the, that money, invest it into local rail for local Dunedin people. That then reduces the cost of living for our people and it reduces um, our emissions as well. So. I can't see any um, negatives to doing that. And <clears throat> second question is, I think uh, you, you, you and your group will be aware, I think uh, ourselves in Mexico are two of the non-signatories to MARPOL. Um, would you encourage us to keep putting pressure on the government for us to become a signatory to that, um, which of course impels places to have things like ship-to-shore power, for example? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not too familiar with that, to be honest with you. Sorry, but yeah. Um. Worth investigating. And final question is, um, um, a, a, a general question I'll probably ask a lot of people in the next few months uh, in the auspices of a, a large ra a a rate rise being being signalled. Would you and your group be happy for, for rate 
pay us money to, to go into investments such as rail, for example? Absolutely, it's an investment in our future and it will actually save um, our community's money in the long run. So I think it's well worth doing. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you for your presentation, Mr Cockle. Could you, would you be able to send through your presentation to um, the GSOs, uh, if you would? Uh, yes, absolutely. And that includes the um, references for all the facts that I've stated as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Councillor, uh, Councillor Mayhem. Kia ora, James. Thank you so much for coming along today. Um, when you're talking about counting emissions, that is from one port to another port. So when a ship leaves Christchurch, it's creating a carbon trail when it reaches here, or would we be measuring where the ship goes from Dunedin to the next port? Well, ultimately, we need, they all need to be counted. You know, right from Australia, comes in up to the top of the North Island, down the North Island, down to the South Island, round to Fiordland, who's counting them there? So, you know, I guess that the devil's in the detail with that. Um, Christchurch has got a way of counting them, and I think we should follow suit with what they're doing. Um, but, you know, we need to also be um, good citizens and, and make sure that those emissions are being counted, you know, wherever they are, not just thinking that, that one small portion is enough, you know. As I said, they're going into the atmosphere, you know. Thanks. And one last question from Councillor Vandervis. Um, you said uh, in one of your facts that uh, the cruise ships take more water than we can afford. Are you aware that since we've had the closure of the PPCS Meatworks, the Green Island Tannery, Cadbury's and a number of other businesses that in fact we have plenty of spare water in the system and that the cruise ships actually pay us quite handsomely for it? Um, can I raise a point of order here? We had water shortages this summer. So I'd like to raise a point of order of um, inaccuracy from the councillor. Oh, uh, I think we had water shortages in certain localities where, depending on where... Oh yeah, it is a singular shortage. system, so, Your Worship. <laughs> yes. Uh, and we don't have any technical information about how much water is available in Port Chalmers and whether they took it from there. So I think it's getting to be a, quite a technical question, both for us to ask and for you to answer, I think. Do you have any technical data on that, some actual data on that? No. Uh, you wish you hadn't ruled on Councillor Vandervis' statement. Well, uh, on the face of it, it seems a reasonable question. However, you know, th there's other elements that then come into it. So, in the, so I think... I think we'll uphold the question but, and ask that in addition to that, uphold the, I won't uphold the point of order, allow the question to be asked, but do you have actual data on actual amounts of water when and where that was taken and, and was that taken when we had a shortage in Port Chalmers? My understanding is that the, the water's being taken at the moment while there are restrictions in place. People at Port Chalmers are very unhappy about that and I think that they'd like to know which of the councillors are, are out supporting them um, and which ones um, aren't too concerned. Thank you. Yes. I'll leave it at that, I'll leave it at that because um, I think that covers both sides of that question, actually. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Moving on. Moving on to apologies. Uh, we have an apology from Councillor Fiso, who is unwell today. So I move we accept that apology and seconded Councillor Mayhem. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Confirmation of agenda. So you have the agenda in front of you. I move that we confirm the agenda without addition or alteration. Seconded, uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Declarations of interest. Are there any changes to the interest register? I see none. Therefore, I move that um, we note the elected members' interest register and confirm the management plans for that. Do I have a seconder for that? Seconder, Councillor Gilbert. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Item number six, confirmation of minutes. We have three sets to confirm. Firstly, 12 March 2024. Do we have any comments on those minutes? No. Therefore, I move that we confirm the public part of the minutes of that meeting. Is there a seconder for that? Councillor Vandervis, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against? 
carried. Uh, I think we we'll, we'll need to speak up when we come to the eyeing and naying so that people are clear uh, that we have uh, agreed with the motion. Next is the council meeting of 20 March 2024. Is there any commentary on that? No, but you're prepared to second. Yes, so I move that we confirm the public part of those minutes. Second the Council of Andalus. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. And thirdly, 27 February 2024. There's no comments. I move that we confirm the public part of those minutes. Second the Council of Andalus. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Reports. So, the first of our reports. Uh, Mr. Hocking and Mr. Lyon will come to the table. This is the um, DCHL interim reports for the six months ending 31 December 23. Welcome, gentlemen. Do we have any opening comments, or are you happy to go straight to questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was going to make a, just a, a couple of opening comments, if I could. Yes, please. Uh, so uh, Peter and I are both new to the process uh, and haven't been at a previous presentation on the SOIs, so feel free to direct us if we go off piece at any point. We are quick learners. Uh, the interim accounts are not audited, as you will be aware, and we won't do a page turn of those. Uh, but I, uh, I will just give a brief summary and then take the report uh, as read and open or, or allow questions on those reports. It is a, uh, a pleasing result. You'll note that uh, in terms of the trading companies, Aurora positive um, to plan, uh, city forests and Delta a little bit uh, behind plan. Uh, taking the full group into account, um, Dunedin Rail also uh, behind plan with the revenue budget in hindsight being somewhat over, overly optimistic. Just with, with Aurora, I would, would note that it is a good result, but the borrowing has increased, uh, and that's part of the um, proposal that we're looking at. Uh, around Aurora is the fact that there is a lot of investment that needs to go into that company uh, over time and that means that uh, whilst we do uh, get profitability from Aurora that doesn't necessarily equate to uh, dividends. In terms of uh, the rest of the report I will take that uh, as read. Um, but happy to uh, happy to take questions. We are anticipating that the results will continue to track relative to how they have been reported in the interim report. Uh, so each of the entities largely tracking as they have done in the first six months. But I would also point out, as you may be aware, the second six months tends to be a slower period. So Aurora in particular is more profitable in the first six months of the year. So net profit uh, before tax is likely to be slightly lower than it is at the uh, at the half year result. That's our current expectation. Um, Peter, did you have any other comments? No, thanks, Tim. I mean that is the key point. Look, uh, we had a number of council workshops and, and discussions around the um, Aurora proposal, and uh, that is key. I mean it's very pleasing to see Aurora's return to profitability, um, on which is follows substantial investment, reinvestment already. But of course, all of the, the cash generated by those, those profits are being poured straight back into the network with additional borrowing. That, that's kind of the key point to make. Thank you. Are there any questions? <coughs> Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I sent you some questions earlier this morning, so I hope you've had a little bit of time to have a quick review. I just want to clarify a few, a few things um, here. So I was noting, um, this is the 
the attachments, the page numbers that I'm referring to. So on page six under activities, the director's report, it just talks about the, um, the program of subsidiary board educations. I just wanted to know a little bit more about that and once completed, um, is there follow-up and training? And then also does DCHL at the higher level do its own annual board evaluations as well? Hopefully you could read my writing. Uh, thank you, Councillor Barker. Yes, so in terms of the subsidiary board evaluations, we require um, a formal evaluation of one board per annum. So the most recent uh, board evaluation was uh, done on Delta, and that evaluation was uh, reported to the Delta board in October last year. I believe the report went to the chair of DCHL at the time as well. And then there was a presentation by Board Dynamics who undertook the evaluation to the Delta Board. We received a report, so we received the, the um, evaluation to the DCHL Board in November uh, together with a summary uh, of the findings. Uh, and we then undertake follow-up with the Delta Board on, on any matters that come out from that. We haven't actually had a meeting with the Delta Board since then because of the, the timing of that, but uh, there were no issues of particular concern and we would expect the Delta Board to be following up on any matters um, and we will be raising that with them. Is the number of board evaluations, given the number of companies that sit under there and it could take six years to do each board evaluation, have you looked at perhaps doing two a year or does that tie up a lot of resource? Sorry. We haven't made a decision to increase the number of evaluations, but I think it is a point well made and something that we should be uh, looking into. Um, you also raised about our own evaluations. So there is a self-evaluation that is done on an annual basis within DCHL. Um, as a board, we will need to give consideration to an external evaluation for DCHL also. Oh, sorry. I just got to build on that. Um, so so that, that self-evaluation program is something we roll out for all group companies. And then the external evaluation using specialist reviewers, that's on, on that cycle basis. Yep. My next question is just around the audit fees. This is on page 12, and they were double this time of the year. And I know we've had issues with our own council audit fees. Is there a reason that they're double? Is it timing or that there's just a giant leap? So the way the Office of the Auditor General works as I undertake it is they do a three year review and that's staggered across the different types of entities that they audit. And so councils and CCOs had their three, re three year review last year and the um, local officers were tasked with getting a more acceptable recovery from those audits, which resulted in significant increases to audit fees, uh, both for the CCOs and also for the council. So did you object to the Office of the Auditor General? I think that possibly council might have done that about the increases in fees. We did. We had several discussions with uh, both the um, uh, our local auditor here and also escalated that through to the national director. Um, we received some um, uh, discount but not, um, not anywhere near as much as we had hoped. Thank you. The next one is about just the, the, on the same page, I think there's a net loss on foreign currency transactions which just double last year and I just wondered how that worked. Is that around the forestry? Is that where that one comes from? Because I know these are consolidated accounts. Uh, Peter may have uh, more to add on this point but it is market based in terms of exchange rate movements and as you'll be aware the uh, the bulk of the revenue for city forest is coming from, from offshore. But Peter did you want to add to that? 
Yeah, that's just an ordinary course of business hedging activity. Um, it happens to show in a loss, but, but I guess the purpose of the, the hedging uh, policy is, is to mitigate a, a, a against uh, significant losses. So, so that's offset by effectively by, by the revenue line. Um, overall, um, the, tr the foreign risk management policy is over overseen by, um, by DCTL. And, and DCC's own uh, risk management, treasury risk management policy as well. So this, it's a relatively conservative hedging policy. So in terms of, as that's showing as a cost, that does represent foregone upside, but it also, that's just the way that it, it transpires in terms of the way foreign exchange movements ha have, have gone in the intervening period. But equally, some other years, it, it, it'll, it'll be worked to the, the, it'll be a positive number to, to compensate for any foreign exchange gains, losses on, 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 on real sales. Thank you. I just wanted to also understand about the, well, I've got, what have I got, um, page 13 and 23, it talks about the carbon credits. And I heard on the news that there was an issue around carbon credits because I think the government was selling a lot more. And I want, just wonder whether you ex could explain, there's a, was it, is it the revaluation, was that unexpected that added the extra 33 million dollars I understand we had like 50 million dollars worth of carbon credits in there but is that a more and then what is the future for carbon credits because I know it's a little bit is it going to be challenged um, so just just in terms of the increase in the value you'll note that the previous year it moved the opposite way so uh, it, it is a little bit volatile and it can be influenced by uh, what's well a, a lot obviously by government policy which is what had impacted carbon credits over the last couple of years. Our expectation and what we are hearing from uh, city forests is they expect the price over the longer term to be stable if not increasing um, but it, it is a it, it's it's a commodity and uh, it will be subject to market fluctuations. Um, Peter, did you have anything to add? No, nothing really to add there. I mean, it has been highly volatile, so so most most of that gain does does represent a reversal of previous <coughs> losses. Um, the good news for us in terms of our P and Ls, most of the, the, those gains and losses are reflected in other comprehensive income and go straight to reserves, rather than impacting on our, on our headline results. So my next question is just around. Um, this is a, an Aurora question around the, we're midway through the process, what page was that? Page 29. What happens at the end of the CPP investment programme? It says that we're halfway through, and will this mean more income and profit? Um, was my question there, because I understand the customised pricing plan was there to help with, a, we're allowed a certain percentage to in, in invest, I believe, and then there's a certain amount that we're allowed to charge the customers. So do we change to a different pricing plan? after this? So my understanding is that a new pricing plan will need to be negotiated and there are two options. Uh, Aurora would have the option of negotiating a new customised price path or they could go to the default price path, so a DPP. At this stage I'm not clear on whether they will move to the DPP or negotiate a new customised price path. In terms of your question as to whether that will uh, result in more revenue, I think that's, uh, that is that that is probably unclear. The important point is that it's a regulated industry and so the revenue is regulated uh, based on the regulated asset base that Aurora have. So I don't think um, and, and the Commerce Commission has to agree to whatever price path Aurora go down, so I don't believe it, it would have a material impact. Thank you. My next question is, this is still on Aurora. I note that it says that there is a um, customer commitments and customer service standard payment scheme, the customer charter, with a goal to launch the new charter in early 2024. It's early 2024 now, so I just wonder where is that customer charter at? Because I, I know that we're going into a process tomorrow of consultation, so I do wonder if that charter is sitting there somewhere for people to look at. Uh, so thank you for sending those questions through. I was able to get an answer from Aurora on uh, this one, uh, and, and the answer is that following consultation 
late last year we sought feedback from the Commerce Commission given we were proposing to make a few minor changes to the KPIs. These discussions with the Commission are ongoing but we're now looking to finalise the Charter for publication in May, June. We received very little feedback from consumers during the consultation despite promoting it quite widely and this is the area that the Commission wanted us to consider in a bit more detail before locking in any changes. So can I just clarify, is what you see that they're going back up to the customers to get more information for the customer charter? Sorry, it was a long answer, so I just wanted to clarify. Sorry, I think they're looking to finalise the charter in May, June. Thank you. I was just also looking at page 41, which is the related party transactions, and I was curious about why three out of five of the directors have purchase of goods and services to their consulting firms. I just wondered, is that a method mechanism for their director's fees? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <coughs> yes, it's, it's related to director's fees. I tried to add them up. but um, So the City Forest one, page 52, basically everybody else who uses interest, is the financial expenses which have increased, um, is that the interest basically on their loans? Yes, that is the interest on their loans, and yes, we can ask them to amend the, um, what, how they um, uh, dictate that in their, in their report. And also, how are they addressing the lost time injuries, which are higher than the target? So lost time injuries are a little bit higher than target. I know that they have an extensive uh, health and safety program in place with training and they take each injury, injury seriously. I, have, I haven't I have had a response from City Forest this, this morning on that point but we do get an update on their health and safety actions and lost time injuries every month. Uh, next question, just in going into the airport, uh, so it talks about their capacity issues, is there any timeline on when they expect their Air New Zealand plane issue to resolve because I can see that seems to be the thing that's holding them back. Uh, so the airport have confirmed that that issue could exist for up to 36 months. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, where is their statement of service performance because everybody else has a statement of service performance and their KPIs in there and airport doesn't. So airport is an associate company as opposed to a full subsidiary. For the interim reporting, they have to report what's against what they have in their statement of intent, and their statement of intent doesn't include a report against the statement of service performance. So they, and they provide a quarterly report, uh, and they don't provide reporting against the statement of service performance. But we have asked them as of yesterday just to confirm their approach in relation to that. It is historically how they've reported. We did have a look at the Local Government Act and it says that the reporting needs to be against what's in their statement of intent. And their statement of intent, unlike the other subsidiary companies, doesn't require them to report against the statement of service performance. So I know the statements of intent are the next thing, so can we ask them to report like the others do, just to tidy it up? We'll take a look into that and work through that with airport and, and give you a response back. Thank you. Our next question was on page 92 and I've just got, um, I just <laughs> use this terminology um, that the prices are set to the June 24 financial year and I just wanted to know is this the 23-24 financial year or the 24-25 financial year that was when they were going to go out to consult with the airline charges? So it's, it's the year ended 30 June 2024. So they're currently in the consultation process that commenced in February and they expect it to be completed by June. So, oh, so just, just timing wise, because there's, you know, there's quite a few numbers forecast and the statements of intent, would that affect the statements of intent? Because I see that there was some more money coming in because of pricing changes into the airport. So I just wondered whether we could expect that to change as well. Good question. So the current um, budgets and forecasts are a roll forward and don't include any changes from that process. 
I'm getting near the end. <laughs> so page 123, this is uh, Dunedin Railways. I just wondered why the operating costs were up 400,000. Is that, is, does that mean that there's more work being done on the tracks? Is that the reason why? There is more maintenance work being done overall. So there's been a substantial lift in maintenance work both on track and on the rolling stock. Just want to, because there was a larger loss than expected from from the budget, and I just want to dig into the reasons about why that is. Um, you know, I think you heard the the gentleman come in and talk about crows before. Was that that there were less trains booked or less people on the trains, or what do you think are the reasons behind it? So the the reasons relate to revenue for Dunedin Railway, uh, not costs. The um, budgeting within rail, I think um, we had this discussion yesterday with them, was it 89 or cruise ships that they, uh, and they they had 55 in the season, so they well, don't, those numbers are not um, checked, but they had budgeted for significantly more cruise ships or, or services running for cruise ships than they actually achieved by quite a significant margin. So uh, as I said earlier, the revenue budget was overly optimistic and that's something that we are looking very closely at with them this year. So I guess this will relate to the statements of intent about um, their reliance on cruise ships and whether they're looking at catering for the international market which has gone up, we've gone back to around 76% of its of its pre-COVID. So are they looking at changing their focus? So I think it's important to recognise that rail is still in a partial hibernation phase at the moment. What we are working with them on and encouraging them to do is think uh, much more strategically about the business going forward notwithstanding that it is in hibernation so short answer to your question is yes we will be looking for whatever opportunities we can given the current state of hibernation that rail is in but we don't have any specific answers on that just yet. So I understand that I think that DVML gets around two hundred thousand dollars for <coughs> running the train. Is that correct? Are they, are they when you talk about they are um, discussing the strategy and making the decisions. Is that Dunedin venues? Because I know that the um, the board of directors basically is the same as the board of directors of DCHL. But is it the DVML that are thinking about those strategic things around the train? Certainly DVML are involved, but it would be fair to say we're trying to bring more ownership within the board of DRL and the operations of DRL for that strategy as well. So we've, we've got a team within DRL that are keen to see uh, that operation as successful as possible and we want to encourage them in that. Just one last question, which is the relief of everybody, no doubt. Page 157, just checking, there was a survey of members, it says, and it says not achieved. Does that mean that the survey wasn't done and you've still got six months to do it, or that the minimum 80% satisfaction wasn't achieved? That was a very good question. I didn't know the answer to that question, and I don't know, Peter, if you do, but I have asked the question of DVML, and I'm waiting to hear back from them. Thank you. Um, thank you for all those answers to those questions. It's quite a comprehensive, compre comprehensive list, but uh, thank you to Councillor Barker for sending through a list prior to give you a chance to uh, accumulate those answers. Now we have five councillors waiting for questions. They are Councillors Gary, Lucas, Walker, Vandivis and Wiley. Starting with Councillor Gary. Thank you Mr Mayor, I'll be quick. Uh, and my first question is page 68 around Delta staffing. Um, I've had more than uh, more contact with Delta staff in recent times than uh, I could have imagined that I would have, but um, uh, I am struck by the quality of the staff and uh, I note that there are some real challenges around recruiting and I have obviously read what's there, but could you expand on that a bit more? So 
so our, our understanding, and so I'm just looking for the sp um, specific piece on page. Third, third last bottom. paragraph. Third last. And then the second, uh, third, third paragraph and third last. It is a matter that we are raising with Delta on a regular basis. Um, and through the course of last year, we were meeting with uh, Delta every month because of the uh, um, challenges with their financial performance. I don't believe that the situation has improved significantly, so they are still struggling to get uh, the right levels of staff, uh, and they're still struggling uh, with the, um, the the border measures and so forth. So, yeah, I, d I don't believe that the situation has improved um, any. But Peter, you may have more information. Yeah, there's some particularly particularly high high skill roles that they're struggling to recruit, and exploring lots of options, inclu including overseas workers to to meet, meet to meet that demand. And there are other. It also plays into the financial performance of the company as well. So, so where they're, they're short of staff in particular areas, particular critical roles, that impacts on the levels of overtime at penal rates, but also employing contractors to do the work at, at a more expensive rate as well. So it's a, it, it's a strategic challenge for them, and, and they're ta tackling it as such, in, in including looking at their, their, their sort of staff engagement and retention and recruitment strategies, uh, as well as some tactical stuff around uh, around recruiting those, those specific roles where they're short. So I have a follow-up question, um, so I just want to be clear. My understanding is it's not around the culture of Delta, it's around the sort of national, international um, skills that are the issue. Am I correct in, in my assumption there? That is also our understanding, correct. Wonderful, thank you. Um, next question is around the airport on page 91. And uh, I was interested for a little bit more explanation uh, and it's under sustainability second paragraph around the Air New Zealand Next Gen Aircraft project, which I remember us having a presentation about. Um, and I wondered if you had anything to add there um, that it says while our proposal emerged as a preferred choice the constraints associated um, meant that it was unfeasible. What were the constraints? Do you know that level of detail? I don't have a lot of detail on that, I, I, but I recall geography being part of it, the, mat the mountainousness of the region being one factor. But, but okay, thank you for that. Um, and just asking uh, a little bit of um, frustration around the I realise they're all individual CCOs, but around the consistency of the format of the half yearly reports, and I've raised this before. Um, one particular thing I just wanted to ask you about, were you aware that all of the different companies, when they sign off the half yearly reports, some have no name at the bottom typed, some have just chair and director, so in future you wouldn't necessarily know whose signature it was, um, and some have the name of the person, might I suggest that perhaps having the name of the person and their, and their role may be useful as a consistent application. Would, would that be something that you could? Absolutely. And uh, page 41, I was, 141, I was a wee bit curious about, um, and this was around uh, the top item, so page 14110. Um, and it's a particular um, goal, a KPI, and it says DP, uh, DCPL does not directly employ any staff, and it designates it as achieved. I would have thought NA would have been a more appropriate um, thing to put in there, would you not? Probably right, yeah. And, oh, I'm sorry. And uh, in the draft FY25 um, statement of intent, we've recognised it's not a relevant measure, so it's been, been, been deleted. And that just brings me back to consistency. Um, I understand, again, I, that they're all individual companies, but any kind of consistency in the presentation would be helpful, in my view, in terms of readability. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Lucas. <clears throat> Thank you. Many of my questions have been asked and answered, but um, also on the attachment page 30 in respect of Aurora, um, network re reliability performance, and I know that this is for the half year to 
31 December, but I'm aware of um, several instances since then, um, which doesn't um, coincide with the with what is written there in terms of um, that they're tracking favourably, blah blah blah. So I mean, is there any commentary about um, what's happened since since the um, half year report in this area? So, so we get updates on network reliability uh, every month. Uh, at this stage, our understanding is that they are still within their targets, um, despite you know, recent recent issues. So, uh, I can I can raise that question. Although we have had recent discussions with them around it, and they've um, assured me that they are still within their targets. Excellent, thank you. Um, on page 80, which is Delta, um, and under contingent liabilities, and there's the paragraph there about the Labor Inspector, Inspectorate Office in relation to holiday pay, um, and it says the work is in the process of being completed, but there's nothing there in terms of a contingent liability, so is there no, no financial liability expected to come from that? Because I know it's quite an issue, and for many companies, I mean, in terms of holiday pay. Yeah, that, that's one got a, got a watching brief on really. So that that's in the process of be, being being evaluated. Um, as you rightly say, some industries have been been impacted in a very very major way, depending on how their um, how their their own policies and, and calculations have been structured. So so it's certainly one we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on. And once it's quantifiable, you know, if it becomes significant, it, it will be in the disclosures at at year end. Yeah. Thank you. And my last question is. Um Dunedin Railways and following on from Councillor Barker's questions on page 120. I guess, I mean, I find the information there is, is very light and I'm surprised that how few passengers have travelled, I mean, that's only mm, about 170 per trip, um, and I know in the past, and we've always talked about the cruise ship um, market has, and for DRL, DRL is significant, and to me that does not seem very significant, so I'm just wondering why those numbers are so light. So uh, DRL operate through a contract with Panamu. Um, as I indicated earlier, it is still in a semi-hibernation. They are a little bit um, uh, dependent on how those services are marketed and the um, relationships that are in place. So I, I know they are doing everything they can, but we do want to encourage uh, them to take a blanket off approach to thinking about how they can improve their revenue even while they're in a semi-hibernation mode. Good. Councillor Walker. Yep, thank you Mr Mayor, thanks for the interim reports. Um, pretty much I'm bereft of questions after previous councillors, um, but I think I do have one. Um, it's around City Forest, it's on page 57, just related to the gearing. Um, the gearing of the company there and the suggestion that independent be benchmarking data confirms it's within range. Just um, a question around what that range is, what's an unacceptable range and what are the peer companies that are they're measured against? Doesn't need to be answered now. Yeah, that might be one to follow up on. Yeah, I don't don't recall the numbers off offhand, but uh, look, I think the overall observation that, that gearing is relatively low is, is still holds good, um, and part part of that is around funding that capital release that, that we talk, talked about, um, but the important but also tying to the conversation earlier around the volatility of, ca of carbon prices. One, one, if one is to, to, to liquidate any any carbon units, it needs to be done at, at an advantageous time. So in the meantime, there is an impact on 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 debt in, in the meantime. Thank you, and just just probably adding that I think carbon credits for me, along with Bitcoin, are um, equally unpredictable at the moment. <laughs> Councillor Vanderus, on page fifty-one, um, it talks about DRL uh, five thousand odd passengers across thirty services. Does that uh, is a service basically one train run? Is it? I would need to follow up on that, to be honest, but my understanding is that that is what it relates to, but that doesn't actually ring true in terms of the number of cruise ships that they've had, so I'd, I would need to follow up on that one. The, the, the reason I ask is that given that 
this is a six month period that would suggest that the train only ran a, a bit over once a week. Is, is that your own? It, it's seasonal. Um, so so, so they, they run during the summer months, so that's why there'll be more services in the second half, at least only up to, up to December. Thank you. Um, the question regarding Aurora's uh, customer charter, um, asked by Councillor Barker, um, does the new Aurora customer charter include an undertaking to respond as if bound by Lagoima uh, rules uh, to requests despite legally not being obliged to? can double check on that and come back to you. Getting on to city forests, there have been some very good questions asked already. Um, I've, I would like to know how many carbon credits are currently owned by city forests, what's their value currently and what was it last year? It says uh, that there's been a, an improvement in carbon and um, I'm very keen to know actually how many carbon credits are being held. So uh, I'll just, if we just go to the balance sheet in terms of value first of all that will provide us some assistance. So. Uh, Find that. If somebody has a page number, then please. Uh, page 55. 74 million. Sorry, actually, if we move to the um, summary. Oh, yes, it is there. Sorry. Fifth, so the value of the carbon credits. Uh, in the carbon credit reserve is 53 million. Uh, at June it was 28 million, which gives you the uplift in carbon credits over that period. So that equates to the um, effectively the 30 odd million uplift that we've seen. In terms of the number of carbon credits, you may have that information, do you? Yeah, I, I'm happy to give you a, a, a written breakdown if that, that'll help. Um, the, the, num the analysis I've got here suggests the total NZ use on hand is uh, 1.4 million, and what they call the safe NZ use um, is just, just over a million units. And then we, there, there's a sort of a, a buffer. So there is a, an analysis in terms of, of, of the, the level and the, and the availability of those, those carbon units that I can give you. So th there's 1.4 million carbon credits currently held by city forests and the value has changed quite dramatically from $28 to $53. Um, why is it then that uh, city forests are now uh, organising $60 million in loans when they could simply sell? carbon credits, why, why are City Forest getting into more debt to pay dividend rather than selling carbon credits? Good question. So w we have a policy in place with City Forests that they will evaluate the holding of carbon credits and look to utilise those on a systematic basis as opposed to using debt we in doing that don't want them to be erratic in the sale of carbon credits given the view that the carbon price could increase quite significantly but neither do we want them to be speculative in relation to that so in terms of the payment of special dividend that may come from the sale of carbon credits um, it may come from a mixture of sale, and sale of carbon credits and debt, um, but it needs to adhere to the policy we've put in place with them around the use of their carbon credits. Thank you for bringing up the special dividend because that's really where I was heading with this. Um, I was concerned that uh, payment of the dividend 
uh, was suggested as, as having to be met by debt um, when we've seen this uplift in the value of carbon credits. We know that it can go all over the place, um, but I'm relieved to hear that you're looking at paying the special dividend possibly out of carbon credits anyway. Um, the, uh, the, the debt situation is of extreme concern to me and has been for some time now. Um, given that we've got 1.4 million um, units available, um, uh, to take on more debt because of a speculative view on carbon credits seems to me to be um, uh, not conservative business practice. Um, would you agree that 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 is uh, that that what we are really looking for is a more conservative um, uh, payment of the of the dividends? I would agree. The intention is that carbon credits would be used to support those special dividends. As you will note, the carbon credit price has lifted quite significantly. So when we were first talking to city forests, the um, sense at that point in time was that the price was too low for them to be used and we're now at a more reasonable price. The expectation is that it may continue to lift in the future and City Forest would be better to provide their views on that, but that does not mean that we're looking for them to speculate. We have got a clear policy in place for them to release carbon credits for funding, um, at least part of that dividend. Okay, thank you. And then lastly on page 186, um, the above assumes, a, this is uh, for City Forest again, above assumes a debt facility being in place of $60 million by June 2024. Um, we've had some difficulty in understanding the continued purchase of farms for forestry. Um, the um, a, a acquisition of massive, really, um, carbon credits and then acquiring debt as well. This 60 million uh, that's going to be in place by June 2024, what's that intended to be spent on? So at this, at this point in time, we're not aware of any purchases of land. We are requiring that any uh, significant purchases come through our board. So we're placing um, governance over any acquisitions of, or significant acquisitions of land. Um, the debt that they are um, suggesting might be in place is not necessarily going to be in place. That will depend on use of carbon credits um, and, and as to whether carbon credits are used to fund the special dividend or, or it's done through debt. So that's, that's not a given. So when it says that it assumes the debt facility is going to be in place by June 2024, that's it's fairly soon, um, you're saying that that's probably not going to be the case then? So I think, and pretty correct me if I'm wrong, I think that was on the expectation that the dividend would be paid from debt, which it may be for this year. Um, so, but... The facility is the availability for, for borrowing. It's not necessarily the borrowing they plan to do. It depends on the timing of, of, of carbon credits. So that's going to be governed by that policy, but we need to have that facility in place to enable them to, 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 to pay that special dividend uh, on time, which is, which is what our shareholder needs. The special dividend's only a fraction of 60 million. What's the other 50 million for? So they, they already have borrowing in place. Right, so what's the extent of the borrowing they already have in place then? Is it near 50, is it? So I understand they're close to 40 million. Uh, is it 30, 35 to 40 million of borrowing at the moment is in place? Thank you for all that. Cheers. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> we have uh, councillors Wiley, then Witherall, O'Malley, Houlihan and Barker. Councillor Wiley, you're next. 
Um, thank you. Um, on page 68 of 272, uh, we have the director's report from Delta. Uh, second to last paragraph, um, it talks about um, Delta received 1.844 million in surplus from sale proceeds from the Yoldhurst development during the prior year comparative period. Um, what I also note on page 77 uh, was up to 12 months 2023 was the 3.094 um, or 3 million uh, was received. Uh, is, is that now completed Yold, Yoldhurst payments to the council and is that uh, fully repaid? That's my understanding. There will be no further proceeds from Yoldhurst. Okay. Councillor Weatherall. Yeah, well, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my question is around page 120 in the uh, Dunedin Railways Director report. report it states under the review of operations. operations that the company's current focus is on maintaining key assets. Could you please explain what specific key assets are being referred to? Uh, so key assets are referring to both track and rolling stock. Thank you. Um, in my in my view, um, the suggestion that they are assets should be referred to as liabilities if they're not making money at present. Is that a question? No, it's a statement. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Nelly. Thank you. Actually, my question is a DRL, DRL question too. At the time of the border closing and the suggestion of, of selling DRL back in, I guess, 19, that's when it got put into hibernation. Um, it's still in hibernation. How, who's, who's going to take it out? And are you waiting for the owner to instruct to take it back out or because the border's reopened? So at the moment, we are waiting for direction around the future of Dunedin Rail. However, we are looking to do as much as we can with the entity uh, in its current form and with its current uh, level of resource to maximise revenue opportunities. Uh, the organisation, as I understand it, was significantly larger when it went into hibernation in 2019. Yeah, it was. Um, also, probably wasn't going to come back in that form when it came back either, which is obviously what's going on right now. But I am, you know, I am actually concerned about the term hibernation, given that you know we we had a summer season this year where the borders were open and free and independent travellers, especially, were available to to the railway, and they've still got this focus on cruise, which, if you go back to the original reports, looked like a. Um, eggs in one basket situation back then and, and we're still with the cruisers so are you looking for us to give direction or are you just waiting for the reports to come in to give direction on lifting the hibernation so I think th th what we're looking for is a steer around the future ownership of Dunedin Rail uh, and that's my understanding will come through in the long term plan so at the moment we're looking to do the, the best with the organisation as it is currently structured uh, with a view to extending services where we can. So if it's going in a long term plan then it's not coming for at least another year then? That's correct. The, any change in ownership would trigger an amendment and given that we are doing an annual plan um, the, that, that is why the decision was taken to push this out. That was one of the consequences of the one-year, nine-year plan discussion. Thank you. Great. Councillor Hulan. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> now, this might be a silly question, but <laughs> I'll just, um, I'm just wanting to get clarification around the sentence on page 61. Under the accrual principle, the safe carbon level credits have been valued based on the current market prices, this is for City Forest, um, carbon, un carbon units that are held to be surrendered to meet future harvest 
liabilities are initially recognised and subsequently measured at nil. So that's saying that um, when they're going to be sold, that takes away the credit. Is that what you mean by that, just to clarify? Yes, so there are certain carbon credits that are required for future harvesting. So they are not an asset that's available for sale. They have to be put to one side. Microphone, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, so does that mean they're not counted in the um, carbon credits, the 40, 33 million, the 40 million, and the, you know, that amount, they're not counted in that, are they? Correct. Right. Um, yeah. It may be in here, but I haven't seen it. Is there anywhere a breakdown on what we have, um, as in pine compared to native? In that, because I think there was that ruling, wasn't there, that you'll get carbon credits and that may change on what you could get for pine. Um, but I don't know whether that, that rule is still going to be put into place or not. Where do we sit with that? And has that made any impact on us? I don't believe there's any information in the interim report on that, but we, we can provide an update from City Forest if you would like. Oh, thank you. It'd be good to know because if we're um, heavy on pine, obviously if that ruling is pushed through or, or comes in, it may even already be in government, I'm not sure I know it's a, something they were looking at, then that could have a huge implication on city forests, as I see it. Um, on another subject completely different, we have a um, notice of motion on our agenda today to get rid of single-use cups. Um, now, I wonder, for the stadium and DVML, if you have any idea what impact, if that was put approved, what impact that would have on those organisations? Peter and I did talk about this yesterday, and I'm just wondering whether you have any, any update on that, Peter. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, I just saw the notice of motion yesterday, so I don't have an update on that. Could I, could I ask, do you have any concerns about any financial impact that could have on the stadium or, or anything to do with DVML if that was info, you know, put into place? I don't believe it would have a significant impact. Uh, the stadium does outsource a lot of its catering, so I'm assuming that that would just be rolled down to the contractors um, that, that are used for that, but we can, we can find out for you. Thank you. <coughs> right. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just uh, another question back around the train. I know I think you might have got this a couple of days ago, is that council made a decision to underwrite the train and I just wanted to understand the actual figures of cash that DCHL has put into the train because I see that in 2022 the loss was 16.08 and then in 2023 there was a $978,000 loss. However, the figures that I got was that um, DCHL had put... 1.7 million in in 2022 and 1.2 million in in 2023. Now I want to be really clear about getting the figures because what's out in the community is that we're putting two million plus dollars in a year. So is there a, a way that we can have perhaps the figures made public? Because I, I, I understand that you, is it correct that you're putting money into underwriting the loss plus a capital injection? And I just want to understand that. Uh, so, yes, we don't necessarily inject the full amount. Uh, we look at the financial position of rail and then inject the amount of money that we believe is required by way of equity. Um, Peter, I think you've got the numbers there. Uh, yes, so, so I believe these numbers have been provided to you already, but just for the benefit of, of um, the full council. Um, so the recent numbers, so the agreement I think was to fund 
<coughs> excuse me, up to $2.4 million a year. FY22 was $1.7 million. FY23, $1.2. And the current year, we funded half a million, but, but currently working on the, on the next injection to go in. So the amount of the injection is, is um, generally driven by the cash needs of the company. So, we're, so we're right now, we're working through the, the, the cash flow forecasts. Um, with DRL and what they're going to need to sustain their level of operations. So I, I guess the it's the level of operations. I guess is the is 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 the key thing. What's achievable um, within the mandate given to DRL, and with, given those constraints, given that generally it's been year to year, and without that um, security of funding uh, for, for 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 railways longer term. It, it, that's one of the difficulties, I think, Tim, in terms of being able to, to have a strategy beyond one year. Okay. So, um, leading into the statement of intent, because I know that you just got the, the motion that we passed to keep underwriting the train, would it be useful for us to give more direction through the statement of intent, and I know we have a period of time to do that, to try and assist with whatever the train is going to be under written with does that <laughs> sorry does that question make sense so using the statement of intent would that be helpful to provide that direction for the train um i'll, I'll come back to that question in just in a minute um the the amount of equity that we provide to to Needham rail is public information so that is um stored within the interim report so page 123 of the interim report shows the equity injections that have gone in and that, that will be the same in the annual report so uh, the combination of those two will give you that, that information so it, it is a, a matter of public record. In terms of the statement of intent process, uh, a couple of comments there. I think we would welcome any direction from Council through that process. One of the things we do have to be careful with with the statement of intent is that they can create quite a level of overhead when it comes to auditing so we just need to be careful around um, what we put in there but we, we would welcome certainly welcome any direction from council around the the services absolutely in the past uh, DCHL came to council with a, a sum that it thought it would take to lift the operations of the Dunedin railways were you aware of that uh, report that came to council was a few years ago, I think. Sorry, I'm not familiar with it. <coughs> Councillor Vandervis. Um, <coughs> in the past uh, couple of years, um, 22, 23, there have been uh, Aurora intra group advances of almost four and then three million. I note there's none here for the six months. Uh, on page, this is on page 37 of of 272, that there are no intergroup advances this year so far. Is that just the first six months? Are there any planned for the second six months, or are we just not going to be doing that now? So my expectation is the intergroup advances probably relate to outstanding work in progress between Aurora and Delta, uh, and it will depend on whether those amounts have been billed. So it's really a timing uh, timing matter as to whether um, billing has occurred between the entities. That, that's my that, that that's my expectation, Peter. Do you know? Um, so <coughs> it may be that we do see more intra-group uh, advances in the next six months, even though there haven't been any this six months. Correct. It will depend on how much work in progress remains unbilled. Um, and, and, yeah, so that's, that's what it relates to. Very good. Well, we appear to have exhausted questions. So thank you very much, gentlemen. That was a, a lot of fulsome answers. And thank you for your uh, forbearance with the uh, large number of questions. But I think that's very illuminating for councillors. Uh, so at this point, I move that we take a recess for eight minutes to stretch our legs. Seconded, Councillor Walker. All those in favour say aye. Against? Carried.
Uh, so, at this point of the piece, I'll move that we um, the council notes the DCHL interim reports for the six months ending 31 December 2003. Do I have a seconder for that? Seconded, uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas. And uh, introducing that, I think I was very pleased that we've had a very fulsome set of answers to all of the various questions that we have. And of course, there are uh, a bunch of unresolved questions for Council uh, over the, the next six months for us to work through as well, not the least of which is DRL. But uh, as we know, we have taken measures to resolve various Aurora questions and also the overarching question of returns from the companies to Council. So uh, I think that um, we've got some really um, useful and actually improving reports here, uh, which have been good to see. And thankfully that they are, uh, you know, picking up. And I think our plan for the future is also good. I'd also like to um, make mention of the retirement of Mr. Keith Cooper from DCHL, who served nine years and four years as chairman. And I'll leave it for the uh, chair of economic development, who will have some further comment to make on that. So, uh, and having said that, I'll pass it over to Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I note this is about the company and the reporting of them for the six months. Um, <laughs> But I do want to acknowledge the contribution that um, Mr. Keith Cooper made uh, through his nine years um, and f uh, four and a half or five years that he um, chaired the Dunedin City Holdings Limited. Um, to think that uh, he put that much energy in and stepped up when Graham Crombie passed away, uh, I think it needs to be noted around this table. Uh, and to thank him for the service to the city uh, during that time because he did deal with quite a few challenges in that period. Um, so thank you, Mr Cooper. Um, I also want to acknowledge, uh, for some of us who have been around the table a little bit longer, back in 2015 we did have the Yoldhurst development uh, issue and it is nice to note that that actually um, was delivered and fulfilled the way uh, it was explained to us would be or could be back in 2015, 2016. Um, there were some critics at the time saying that it would never be repaid or we would not come out of it with any real resolution, so it's nice to see that being closed off. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and yes, I did have a lot of questions, but I think it's really important that we keep asking those questions and digging down to these accounts. This is nearly $2 billion worth of assets, so I think that we do need to spend that time examining those reports and, and, and digging down into things so that next time perhaps we won't have quite so many questions. Uh, this was a, a, a pleasing result. Most of, most of them were on plan. Um, apart from the overly optimistic budget for the train and I think we need to, to have a, a good examine of the train and how we will run it for the next year. Um, good to see the asset growth of $150 million and the profitability of most companies, especially Dunedin venues related to FIFA and that was, I guess, we might say a blip but a positive blip because the council itself actually did invest quite a lot of money into getting FIFA here so it was nice to see the impact on Dunedin venues. So I did um, look at all the, the KPIs and how they were tracking. I saw that Aurora was on track to achieve 96% of their KPIs, City Forest 100% and the rest were uh, on track as well. So that leads through to the, the statement of intent. My concern was around Dunedin Airport and their reporting because there was not the KPIs reported so I'd like to see that in the statement of intent which is coming up. My only concern really was uh, I know some some statistics around the injury harm and st sick leave for three of the companies and I don't know whether it's a COVID thing but our responsibility and the director's responsibilities are towards health and safety. I did ask questions specifically around board evaluations and I think that's really important for us to make sure that we have the best boards in place um, to run those companies on behalf of the 
the people of Dunedin. I think it's really key that we're actually looking at the investment plan at the moment and why we hold these CCOs, because some of the animate money and some of the, um, maybe because we don't have anywhere else to put them. Um, so it's good that we're looking at the investment plan, why we hold them. So is it financial, is it for um, community assets, but we also expect them to, to wash their own faces. Um, in summary, thank you gentlemen for uh, presenting those reports and thank you for your answers. I really appreciate those and thank you for you to you and all of the staff for the work that you do looking after our companies. We, we do appreciate it. Councillor Gary. Oh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I want to speak around staff because behind the figures of these half-yearly reports are a large number of staff across the companies. And uh, success doesn't happen without their very hard work. Um, and I want to particularly mention Delta. Um, and you know we've often looked at Delta as potentially a problem child, but uh, we have heard today around uh, the reasons for some of their challenges and I particularly asked questions around staffing, recruitment and retention because it's easy to think that is the fault of the company when in fact in this case it's around that wider recruitment and retention. As I mentioned in passing, I've had a lot to do with Delta staff recently in my personal capacity more than I would casually imagine and I have been struck by the quality of the staff the professionalism of the staff, the diversity, um, and and that is a point to be really proud of. Um, and I've observed that quietly uh, in my personal capacity, and I wanted to relay that to you. So um, my thanks go to the people on the ground who are the ones who do the work, uh, and uh, we are seeing the results of that. I also talked about consistency because I think in readability around these reports there is a bit of progress to be made and thank you Mr Lone and Mr Hocking around uh, your answers to my questions. Uh, consistency around how they're presented and I particularly draw attention to the dial uh, report which has um, icons uh, to give a really good idea of overview, it's very readable um, and I'm sure there's a bit of work that perhaps could be done there. Um, finally, I, I want to mention Mr Cooper. As uh, Councillor Wiley said, Mr Cooper came into his role in a very difficult circumstance with the passing of Graham Crombie. That's never an easy scenario. And he has served the city for nine years uh, in the role as a director. Uh, and uh, I always found Keith to be a very approachable person who uh, certainly was committed to the city uh, and doing the very best uh, that could be done for it, which isn't always easy, dealing with um, uh, elected members and local government, it's a different uh, aspect entirely, um, and sometimes messages uh, aren't the easiest for us to receive. So I want to thank Mr Cooper for his service to the city uh, and thank you, that's all I have to say. And with that, I'll put the motion. Uh, that uh, The motion is that we uh, note the interim reports. All those in favour say aye. 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 Again? Against? Carried. And moving on to item eight, the statements of intent for DCHL companies. And I welcome back to the desk, Mr Lone and Mr Hockey. And wonder if there are prefacing comments to start or should we go straight to questions? Sorry, I will be very brief, but just a couple of um, quick comments uh, around the uh, statements of intent. I think um, importantly uh, one of the items to note is that these are still very much draft so you'll be aware that we're, we're working uh, through the forecasting and budgeting round with, uh, with the companies applying challenge as well to that. Uh, so there are a number of um, TBCs which will be, will be confirmed uh, and we will um, be very happy to work uh, with with council and council feedback in relation to that as well, um, 
there, there is uh, definitely a focus on dividends and return that's very clearly recognised uh, around the DCHL table and uh, obviously the current proposal uh, that we're looking at in relation to Aurora forms a part of that. Uh, I think um, one of the key other points that I wanted to make is that we have been working with um, the Audit Office to try and streamline the audits and um, make some improvements and uh, one of the challenges we've had is uh, with the statements of intent and the auditability of, of those. So we have uh, attempted to, without um, re re reducing uh, necessary measures, we've, we've tried to make the statements of intent and encourage the subsidiaries to make the statements of intent um, very specific uh, and measurable. And we will also welcome being able to provide to council additional reporting as required if it's felt that there are areas where you would like to get more information but we don't necessarily include that within the statement of intent because of some of those auditing challenges that we have. Audit have also encouraged us at the DCHL level to incorporate within, uh, within our measures group measures and so you will see that we have incorporated into the DCHL statement of intent what we consider to be the strategically important measures from each of the companies so that has extended out um, the DCHL statement of intent and I think really that's, that's probably enough from me as, as opening comments, happy to take questions. Thank you and very happy to receive those, thank you Mr Lyon. Uh, first question is Councillor Gary followed by Councillor Barker. Thank you. Um, and I've got a range of questions over the statements of intents, but if, I'll start with the um, Aurora. I just wanted uh, a bit more information around Aurora's involvement in renewable energy. There's a, a mention of it in there, but it's going to be an important sector, and we know from central government that it's a focus for the new government. Do you have any comments about that? And I take your point, Mr. Lone, about you know more detail, um, but you have encouraged the companies to talk about specifics, and that to me seems an important specific. I, I agree, and it's it's an item of conversation that comes up with Aurora um, and, and our discussions with them um, quite a bit. Um, I, I'm probably going to struggle here to expand on that point, but I'm happy to get a statement from Aurora on that and, and provide that to you. I don't know, Peter, if you had anything further you wanted to... No, I can't offer any more insights, but, but yeah, absolutely have, happy to, to, to yeah, facilitate that. That's just fine. Thank you for that. And um, City Forests, and it's something I've raised before, and it's, ra it's mentioned generally, again, but again this is a specific, and that is the management of slash. Um, it was a real concern for this community following Cyclone Gabriel and all of the impact of damage from slash. I don't believe, unless I've missed it, the word slash is mentioned in there. And I, and I know I was happy with the answers I received, but I just wonder if perhaps it might be worth, would you consider it worth mentioning that? in the environmental context in the Statement of Intent? Yes, we'll have a discussion with City Forests on that. Um, further, uh, I noticed again, and this is around consistency again, some things, uh, one of the things I raised previously in Statements of Intents were around sponsorship. And I noticed it's articulated um, really well, page 249, it talks about sponsorship aligning with DCC strategic uh, strategies, or st strategic framework, I should say. Um, in others, it doesn't mention that. That was the point I raised around linking it with any sponsorship with this uh, DCC strategic framework. And so there's a variety of responses to that. And again, I think that's something that, having raised it, it should be consistently articulated. I was a little concerned on, I think it's page 264, where it said we're practicable, because that can be an excuse for all sorts of things. Um, I'm not saying that the sponsorship in place is not appropriate, I just think it needs to align and be articulated as aligning. 
Um, and I also noticed a bit of variety in the way um, diversity in terms of culture and diversity in the, in the staffing was articulated. It was good to see it there. Uh, and again, zero carbon, um, there's generally the, the phrase uses non-controllable emissions and potential cost of ops offsetting uh, residual emissions. Um, and I guess what I'm looking for is, you know, how do we see progress in that? Because that doesn't tell me a lot. And how do we, obviously in the reporting, but it just didn't feel specific enough. So um, would that be something that we're worthy of consideration? So I think your comments around alignment are important. And I, I would be keen to see um, greater alignment uh, across a number of those areas as well, so we'll, we'll work on that. When it comes to carbon, I, I think the, the area we just need to be a little bit careful about is being able to measure um, the progress that we're making. Um, so leave that one with us and we need to work with the city as well to make sure we're aligned with the city and what they're doing. Yeah, just just on carbon. Look, we're about, about to engage with all the companies again in connect uh, together with the zero carbon team in council. Um, this is my first opportunity to really properly engage in this area, having been been tied up with some other things in more more recent months. So so kicking to explore what we can what we can commit to at this at this point as well. Um, you know, and it, but it might be that in, in future years we're able to be much more specific around those things. Understand. Thank you. Um, and two more. Uh, just a, a, a quick question. I just wonder if you'd noted. On page 225, there's a bit of a double negative there in the second, on the right hand side, performance targets, um, second from the bottom, uh, which doesn't kind of read so well. So that may be, I just wonder if that could be had a look at. And then page 261, um, the dial report, the dial statement of intent, um, barriers towards the Trans Tasman um, goals. Um, in the statement of intent, would you see, just speaking, Mr. Lone, to the specifics you mentioned, um, a little bit more detail around that because it's a fairly general statement. There's no time frame. There's no kind of steps towards that outcome in there, and that may not be possible to be specific about. But I just, do you think it would be possible to be more specific? I would like to think that it could be um, possible to be more specific. I think we are all around the table very keen to see. Uh, those services resume as quickly as possible. So, um, yeah, we'll have a chat with them about it. And I think not only us, but the community. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you. I have um, the covering report was written by council staff, and I don't know who's going to answer this question. In uh, next steps 11, it says, Feedback will, uh, elected members will be able to provide feedback via email or through a workshop. And I can't see a workshop in my diary because the deadline for the feedback is the 10th of April. So, ah, Carolyn, sorry, I didn't see you. But last time we did it via email because um, there were a relatively few of you who wanted to provide feedback and might, I anticipate it will be that way again. So I'm wondering, given the, what is it, page, gosh, I can't find the page number, but just talking about the train, because in, in paragraph of your report, sorry, that was um, paragraph 23 of your report, you just talk about the fact that you submitted the, the draft SOI for the Dunedin Railways and you basically rolled it over because we hadn't really made any clarity of decisions. So I'm just wondering whether a workshop would be useful around talking about the railways or because this is going to be a little bit of a process I guess would that be helpful to talk to councillors or the challenge if I may is that we have an existing council position on this which is the continuation of the hibernated model whatever that means until the nine-year plan my real challenge is with the definition of what hibernation means, and I think that we could everybody around the room could have a different um, version of what the word hibernation means. So that, that's my concern. Is obviously our direction to you. So I just wondered if we can work through clarifying that. I'll just stick that one there. The other questions I have is: do, when we're looking at our um, 
statements of service performance measures, and I know that we've been through a process for the last few years, and I know you guys are, are newish to this process, I just wondered if you consider benchmarking with other CCOs about their performance measures. I know that we looked last year at the, the accident rates or something like that, because I had a, a, a few questions about that, but is that on the ag agenda for you to, to think about? Uh, benchmarking with other CCOs hasn't specifically been on the agenda. We do get uh, an element of benchmarking comes through Audit New Zealand, so they they do give us a little bit of direction um, to the extent that they can. Uh, it's it's certainly something that we could look to do and or look to <coughs> encourage where appropriate the subsidiaries to do. Yep. Sorry, Councillor. I was just just going to build, build on that. Just in that you mentioned health and safety, so that that's one area where, where, where we, we've got a, a body of work that we're, we're kicking off, and we're looking, at, and that body of work includes how um, some of those health and safety measures cascade. So each individual board is charged with managing the specific risks, but also, but the the reporting what gets served up in in these KPIs might might change following that body of work. Thank you. Uh, my next question, page 194, there's a target to develop diversity, equity and inclusion strategy. Uh, I just wonder if it sh can have a by when, because it was also in last year's statement of intent, so it would be useful just to, to put a date in so it kind of um, is a smart goal. And then I wanted to go also to the sponsorship policy on page, I have down here page 207, and I wonder whether that was going to be set at the DCHL level to cascade down because as Councillor Gary has brought up there's a number of different um, sponsorships. We're also, we're also going to be doing a grants review so somehow how do those relate to each other? Yeah, I, I think we've purposely kept the wording fa fairly general there. I mean, it's interesting in, t in terms of consistency, I actually gave some suggested wording on that very point, Councillor Gary, and uh, then uh, some some of our CCOs have interpreted it in their own fashion. Um, but uh, yeah, look, uh, I, it's some work work for us to do, probably during April, to, to I've uh, linked together with the council staff member uh, around uh, sponsorship policy and, and thinking about how we actually organise that work. So it's a little bit, the wording there is a little bit placeholder, I think it's fair to say. And just the dial Dunedin Airport, can we add that they report against their a statement of performance measures every oh, on the six month because that was a, a big gap. I know they did some commentary but they didn't actually report on their measures and I think it's kind of important. Yeah, we'll, we'll have that discussion with them. We'll, we'll revert if there's any, any concerns or issues that they raise in relation to that but um, We've asked them to look at it um, from from yesterday when that was first raised, and we'll certainly be encouraging them to do that. Great. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lucas. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I have several questions. The first one's very minor on page 193 um, for Delta when in their activity um, they're maintaining parks, sports fields, walking tracks in the northern part of the city. I'm just wondering whether the word northern actually needs to be in there. I just think, I, I would um, think that they do that um, more widely than the northern part. Um, and then if we can move to page um, 225 in relation to um, DRL, and, and I find that those performance measures, there's very few of them. Um, and I yes, I hear that it's kind of in hibernation mode, but I, I am surprised that we actually have so few performance measures and also in light of if we then also if I can link that question to page 229 when you refer to um, the reinvestment in the Torrey Gorge line between Hinden and Pukerangi in order to enable passenger services to Pukerangi in 24-25 summer season so I'm just wondering where that's at and whether that can also be um, a performance measure related to that. Yeah, happy, happy to take those notes. Um, you know, in our cover report, we, we said, look, we're wait, waiting for for um, direction from council. We've got that through the resolution now, and look, I, I think there's, uh, I would anticipate some changes for the DRL SOI as a result of that. But we do need to work through it, both in terms of ga gathering um, council's wishes, as we discussed, but also um, 
uh, management thinking about well, what can be achieved under, under the constraints of, of the model as it is right now. Um, thank you. Moving on to page 234, Dunedin Stadium, Stadium Property, where um, for 2025 they've got three million in capital expenditure. I'm just wondering whether, which is significant for them, whereas you know going forward there's only a couple of hundred thousand. I'm just wondering whether there needs to be a commentary in relation to that capital expenditure and what that's for, because it's, it seems to be out of the norm. Uh, sorry, Councillor Lucas, I missed the page number. Two, three, four. So just uh, further clarity on what the capital expenditure is going to be used for. Yep, certainly. Um, 246 for Dunedin venues, and it's kind of related to back to 244, the fact that there's no um, service performance measure in terms of number of events. And on 246, um, if you look at the cash flow for operations over the three years, that they're declining from almost 2 million, you know, 1.7, then to a million. Um, and I guess my concern is that looking at those forecasts, that the forecast is for a relatively light calendar of events. Um, and I'm quite concerned that that's what that's what's being forecast and, the, and there's no reference um, in their service performance to activity at the stadium. Yeah, let, let's um, just have a discussion with them on that. I have already asked them for some details on their events planning. Uh, and so really your, your question is, can we include some more detail on future events within their statement of service performance? Yep. Thank you. And just finally two questions on um, Dunedin Airport 267. And it's a similar item, a similar question in relation to stadium property and their capital expenditure where they've, um, their budget is 11.5 million, then 21 million, and then down to 4 million. So obviously, there and there's no mention in there anywhere in their um, statement of intent about obviously they're proposing significant capital expenditure. I just think there needs to be some, some detail added to that. Um, and also then on page 268, there, one, two, three, the uh, fourth bullet point from the bottom, um, when they talk about the interest rate of 6.3%, including Westpac's margin, uh, just a question, so they don't borrow through Dunedin City Treasury? That's correct. Look, uh, and we'll take those points on the narrative around the, the, the there is a quite, quite a quite a detailed capital expenditure plan. Um, the, 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 their asset management planning is, is, is quite evolved, so we can certainly put some commentary around that, I would imagine. Very good. Councillor Hulan. Asked and, <coughs> asked and answered, thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Actually, my first one is the map on page 256 for the driving times from Dunedin Airport. Has it ever taken you four hours to drive to Timaru? <laughs> so actually my second question is can I make sure I'm not in that person's car? Um, I, I have a question which is not on this but it sort of relates to um, Dunedin Airport and DBML and our future competition with Christchurch um, stadium when it comes and the ability of Dunedin Airport to accept cargo planes that are carrying the, the equipment for the concerts um, along with the inability of Dreamliners Boeing 787s to land at our airport that they have a, I've just looked them up, 14,000 kilometre range which, which means ones flying out of Asia can fly direct to Christchurch but they can't fly direct to us because they can't land which leaves us with the Airbus A320 and only the Australian market to look for Given, and also there's one more thing in the background, if the Alpine Fault goes, the airport may be a critical component for landing uh, material in, in a civil emergency. So I hate to be a person who brings this up because when you bring it up you're almost accused of, of no not bad luck, but actually yeah. fantasising and that is, could, there, could we get any report at some point in the future out of dial over strengthening the runway so it's capable of taking the bigger planes and especially as it relates to our com the one I'm really thinking of is our competitiveness with the stadium given that that's at least a 300 million dollar asset 
and in fact in Christchurch it's going to be a $600 million asset. The cost of making that runway enabling so that it could work with DVML. So it's not in the SOI but I don't know where else to bring it up. I'm not sure when we last had DIAL in for a briefing or a workshop with Council, but it could be that that's something that we can ask them to speak to uh, when they come in for a, for, a, for a workshop, and I think they may almost be next on the list for us. Yes, they are, and, and, and they're keen. I spoke to Chris Hopkins uh, just a week, week, week or two ago, and he, he, he was keen to, to be, be in front of you. Well, thank you. And then I guess my other question is probably for the CEO because it, it's already been raised. How do we define hibernation for DRL given the timetable has now been defined? That, that's tricky and at the time when the council made the decision to put it into hibernation, I'm sure it was considered then. That was, um, I'm not sure. So the, I, I guess, I know it's tricky, I don't oh. have an answer. I can assure you that we didn't have much time to make a decision around the definition of the word because we were faced with actually getting rid of it. And we said, don't get rid of it, put it in hibernation. But there, I, there was no real time because I remember Councillor Gary saying later, it's unfortunate the word hibernation was the word that was chosen. Well, well I thought you... Um, if I may, Mr Mayor, I'm happy to have a, um, a chat with, um, with Tim about what that might mean and circulate something, but it, it's um, yeah, it's tricky. I can assure you there's certainly a lot of enthusiasm at, uh, at Dunedin Rail to see what they can do and, um, and, and how they can improve the services and the revenue. So um, we'd, we'd w welcome the engagement and, and the conversation on that and we are encouraging them as well. So. I would note that in the uh, statement of intent for DRL, their operating um, guidelines uh, talk about the um, desires of council, but only as a, quite a limited range of desires, because of course one of those desires is to have all of the uh, CCOs operating in the black and returning dividends if possible. So there could be another, it could be a relatively simple thing to include that. Would that, would that be a simple thing to include? I was putting that as a question. I'll get that, Mr. Mayor, because if you remember, we're also doing the investment plan, which is looking yes. at our trading companies and those other companies. So I think probably we need to wait until that work's done before we um, change the, the dividend requirement for something like rail. Well, not a requirement, just in a, 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 a direction. Anyway, <clears throat> that's fine. We'll move on to our next question. You're finished, Councillor Milley. Councillor Vandervis. Um. I'm grateful to Councillor Lucas, um, Deputy Mayor Lucas, for bringing up the capital expenditure of the Dunedin Stadium Properties Limited on page 234 um, as a bit of an outlier number. My memory, which is a bit um, um, from probably 10 years ago, was that they were obliged, the Dunedin City Stadium Property Limited were obliged to come to Council if they were contemplating a uh, capital expenditure of over a million dollars. Um, there was essentially a cap. Is that still the case? If not, why not? I would need to have a look into that. I'm not aware that we have been operating. Un I think it changed, and so I, I think, Carolyn, that DCHL have to come to council over five million, but the companies get to go to DCHL under that amount. Yeah, but, but we'll check. So is the suggestion that um, the Eden Stadium Properties Limited would have to go to DCHL if they had uh, a proposal for a capital expenditure of over one million still? I asked for the lights, uh, Mr Mayor has just reminded me, which was over a million, but there are, there's a hierarchy of um, sign-off points, but we can circulate that. Would it be an inconvenience um, for, for there to be a cap on capital expenditure from the Eden Stadium Property Limited, given that there have been in the past um, uh, 
the million dollar limit gone over without coming to council. I'm thinking particularly of the extra seating that was um, ordered quite some time ago. And given also that we have a major recent um, capital expenditure on lights, another one on new video um, screens, that I had a number of questions around that simply weren't able to be answered. Um, so the question really is, can we in the new SOIs um, clarify what needs to come to council and what doesn't in terms of capital cap? Um, I'll jump in there. I think we have a different mechanism potentially available for that. Um, that um, I'll talk with Mr Lone and, and you're aware of it, but I'll, I'll remind you of it once the meeting is... Um Sorry, thank you. I didn't mean to stray into that uh, particular area. Um, that'll be me for the meantime. Yeah, and I'll just make a comment to my recollection. Um, DCHL or DVML did come to council for money for the lights because we had that lighting upgrade, but I'm not sure. But uh, six months or so ago, but uh, I'm sure an investigation it won't take much of an investigation to find out. <coughs> anyway, thank you. Um, <coughs> next question from Councillor Benson Pope. Uh, thank you. Just going back to the earlier questions about the constraint, operational constraints on on the runway, well, on um, Mamona. Um, I'm sure the information is readily available, so I'm not suggesting a great deal of expense um, in obtaining what you come back to us with, but um, clearly it's not just a matter of length. There's also the width and the pavement strength, the constraints at both ends for aircraft turning and the complete lack of any taxi bus, which slows operations when there's as they often are at peak times, conflicting flights. Um, so can you include, get some information about the actual costs of of what we're talking about here? Uh, I mean, no one, no one disputes the issues that there is a constraint, the fact there's major constraints, um, but if we're going to put it on the table, let's have all the information, please. Um, I mean, the runway appears to be longer than Queenstown, for example, but I don't know about the performance specs of the pavement, and I do know about the width being the problem with the uh, um, 787s. Um, so it would be good to have the whole picture, please. I'm sure included in that will be the fact that there is another shareholder. They're very unwilling to invest it. However, uh, next question. You're finished, Councillor Benson Pope. Yes, uh, Councillor Gary. Oh, thank you, Mr Mayor. And look, I'll ask it as a question, but it's around clarity and going back to Councillor O'Malley's point with um, D Dunedin oh, yeah. Railways Limited. Um, are you aware that um, we chose the wording really carefully rather than mothballing hibernation? I'm presuming you're aware of how carefully that was worded and has been consistently used. So the second part of that is, uh, are you aware that when we made the decision, we really didn't know what was ahead? It was, you know, COVID times and post-COVID, so the time frame wasn't talked about because we simply didn't know. Are you aware of, of that in the decision making? So uh, both Mr Hocking and myself were at Dunedin Rail yesterday uh, having a discussion because they're, uh, fair to say, they're reaching to you know, see what they can do. They're, they're really keen to, um, you know, to have a look at opportunities and, and, and what can be done. Uh, and we, we made the comment then that uh, only one of us in the room uh, had been there pre-hibernation. So there probably isn't a great level of understanding um, amongst us. But in terms of the rail staff themselves, the ones that are there, a number of them were there hibernation but speaking for myself and speaking for uh, Mr Hocking no yep that, that's good to know and, and and of course time frame now is important but uh, at the time of decision making as, as Councillor Malley pointed out it was a different scenario and it just wasn't possible to put a time frame on it very good so we appear to have exhausted questions uh, in that case I'll uh, the <coughs> With the motion that we note the statements of intent for the DCHL companies. Seconded. Uh, we've already, uh, so, 
I think we already, I already uh, put the, what I moved and seconded earlier. So now, have I or not? No. no. So I'll move it and second it, Deputy Mayor Lucas, and I'll speak to it. That's right. So um, in speaking to this, we, I think this has been a good opportunity to raise our, um, thank you, gentlemen, raise our, uh, I suppose, consciousness of the statements of intent and make some suggestions and ask questions thereof. So in this session, we have, um, uh, by the look of it, to be refined some of those statements of intent. And we do have, uh, because they're draft statements, we do have ample opportunity to, we have some opportunity to send in emails of any further suggestions that we may have. So I commend that to you. Who would like to speak to the motion? Councillor Barker. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. We looked backwards before the break um, about our six-month reports, and now we're looking forward to what our $1.9 billion worth of assets is going to, um, to work for us. And this has been a long process. We've gone through the... Uh, in the last few years around the leaders of expectation, which I don't think we had previously in tidying up the process. So I did ask that question around benchmarking for some of the measures, because I think it's important for us. We, are, we don't want to get, I guess, lazy about rubber stamping any of this. We've been looking at them very carefully. And it's good to see a good process for the feedback. Previously, we didn't have to, we didn't have workshops, et cetera, for this. So my concern is around just emailing through suggestions. I think that a workshop would be good, especially around an and rail and a number of councillors have brought this up about the definition of what hibernation means, the fact that 76% of international visitors had returned, that the FIT market is is growing and what how can we make the train? I would love for it to be able to wash its face and that's why I asked the questions earlier to try and define exactly what money had been put into the train and, and because there is stuff going out there that it was $2.4 million a year and the actuality is it was 1.7 the year ended 2022 and 1.2 the year ended. 2023 so I think now that we really need to be focusing on how can we use the train um, to, to, to make a bit more money perhaps and to, and to also we have a lot of feedback from visitors that the train isn't available for FIT so we have that back from visitors back from operators etc so I think we need to to make it work for us and the um, board have indicated that they would like more direction and I think that that would be good for us to have a workshop or have a chat about how we can provide more direction for that. Uh, I also just asked a couple of wee questions. I think that we need to make our SOIs very specific and very smart goals so they are time bound um, but overall I'm a lot, a lot more happy with the SOIs than I was when I actually arrived at council and I'm very um, impressed with the way that the DCHL and the, and the companies have been delivering on those. When we're getting 100% achievement on delivering some of the um, statements of intent measurements, I think we need to concentrate on how can we make them stretch goals. Everyone loves one of those, so let's have a good think about that. Very good. Councillor Malley. Hey, Mr Mayor. Um, as can often happen in these items, one or two things can catch, end up dominating the speech. Um, I do want to... Um, follow Councillor Barker's comment about how the SOIs have improved over the years. They've got a lot better since when I first got on Council. Um, I just wanted to clarify what I was asking about the Dunedin Airport, and it is really about sometimes if you've got two activities together, looking at whether or not there's um, opportunity for one to help out with the other. And as my role on the Regional Transport Committee, um, the, it, when and if the Alpine Fault goes, we, it, is, it is considered that road transport will be severely damaged for long periods of time and it will require air transport to move um, emergency goods around the country. So I think that is an important thing for to consider Dunedin's role there, especially our general protection from the um, actual force of the earthquake when Christchurch is expected to get hit as hard as it was during the last earthquake. Um, and when we take into account the amount of money that we've invested into the stadium and we are seeing lower and lower apparent forward bookings, I think we need to make sure we do not leave ourselves in any way exposed to being non-competitive. I fully understand what Councillor Benson Pope had to say. I'm not naive to the cost of upgrading these runways. Um, it will be large. But I, but I would actually like to actually talk about real numbers because often it's not, this usually gets past, now I can't be bothered. 
I, I have been here before. Um, so it will be nice if the airport can come up maybe with just an early rough concept of whether or not you know what the burden would be to upgrade um, and then if that is of interest then we might go further into it after that um, and again I think we do it will be nice to look at back at what hibernation does mean for DRL um, I know we are postponing it as we go through with the ownership but could we be looking at next summer where with temporary workforce to bring it up to a new operating level that the, those who run it would consider they could be able to potentially deliver. Thank you. Councillor Vandervis. Um, very much appreciate the comments that have gone uh, before, especially from Councillor Barker. I think she summed up a whole lot of things that, uh, regarding the improvements in SOIs. Um, I'm, uh, however, personally a bit cynical about SOIs. Um, you know, your statement of intent, trying to put into words what you expect the companies to do, and um, they start to get, take on a life of their own and become very detailed. Um, there is one fundamental thing that I think our companies need to do, and I'm talking about our main companies, I'm not talking about uh, rail, I'm talking about Aurora, Delta, um, and uh, especially City Forests, and that is uh, the intent, in my view, is simply provide us with dividends. And it concerns me that that hasn't been a focus for many years, in my view, and that even today, if we look at page 177 of the uh, uh, um, City Forest's um, objectives, it says, City Forest's purpose is to operate sustainable forests for our future. Operating sustainable forests sounds all very well. But what I believe it really should read is operate sustainable forests to provide dividends for our future. It's the dividends that should be the focus, not the building of a forestry empire, and certainly not the building of hundreds of millions of dollars worth of carbon credits that have basically been stashed away, as I see it, um, for, um, well, uh, future uh, against uh, future um, harvesting requirements but we've got a situation where the carbon credits have not been well uh, uh, highlighted in uh, paperwork that we've had from City Forest in the past. Um, they represent an enormous uh, amount of basically ready cash currently with the price having gone up quite significantly in the last year quite aware that it's a volatile market and then it goes up and down. Um, it's the very volatility of it that makes me wonder why it is that we're keeping such massive amounts of carbon credits and why we aren't using carbon credits in a good year uh, to uh, provide dividends rather than further debt. So the, the, the further debt issue, again, uh, I mean, uh, I, I hate to keep saying the same thing over and over, but I find the need to because the intent in this SOI again is simply to pay dividend this year uh, by borrowing the money through mostly city forests. I don't think that that is um, where the dividend should be coming from. And given that the we've got the carbon credits option, and given also that Aurora uh, because of its increasing value, should also be able to supply dividends and doesn't plan to for the next two years. Uh, and, and the SOIs, again, I find disappointing. Um, hopefully we are going to address these problems with some of the changes that are coming up. And uh, I look forward to um, uh, seeing real dividends and returns from the council companies. I'm very glad that this council is really getting into the detail of what is happening in our council companies, which is something that hasn't happened for many, many years in the past. Companies have either been in the too hard basket or something that we weren't even allowed to talk about. Um, we are right into it now. There is enormous potential for us to actually get value from the companies that we haven't had in the past. And I look forward to these um, new SOIs and reviews coming up to actually do that. Uh, Councillor Gilbert. 
Uh, thank you. Just fairly briefly, Einstein is credited with saying something along the lines of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And it seems to me that um, there might be benefit in looking at the operations of some of the CCOs with a bit more of a blue sky lens. And I'm very pleased to hear comments uh, earlier on about uh, encouraging a less blinkered approach, which to me is along those lines. For example, uh, the airport fully agree about around the concerns with AF8 and opening ourselves up to flights, direct flights at least from, from Asia. But I also think it's part of looking forward to what the airport needs to look like in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. City forests, for example, uh, there are operations overseas that have secondary and sometimes tertiary revenue operations running off the same land simultaneously. And as others have, have pitched, uh, pitched in, I'm going to go into rail as well. As I have made, I think I've made clear in previous comments, to me, we're in the process of ostensibly hobbling a horse and then judging it on how fast it can run. Uh, so we can't, I don't believe we can continue uh, as we are and then come to, no matter how many reports come to us, and then expecting to be able to judge the horse on how fast it runs. Again, there's a, uh, a few judge uh, a goldfish, a few, what is the, the saying? If you judge intelligence on uh, cl tree climbing, then a goldfish is never going to get anywhere or something along those lines. We're asking ostensibly to, to judge a company on what it can achieve without actually allowing it to show us. So uh, I would, I'm hoping that there's going to be some really blue sky, big picture, long term thinking, not just the, uh, the immediacy. So I look forward to seeing some of those in the final SOIs. Very good. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yes, I, I know this sounds scary, but <clears throat> we've all, quite a few of us have mentioned it, and we do have to plan for these things. Um, is that around F8, AF8, I, I, um, uh, people have said to me, and I don't know whether this is true, So, but that in central Otago, a lot of that area, I think people will need to be helicoptered or flown out. Because um, a lot of the, as Councillor O'Malley mentioned, a lot of the roads will be damaged. Um, so, uh, and my understanding is a lot of them will be brought here. Now, if they try to bring them here and we can't land them for any reason, I think this enforces why we need to um, definitely review and look at um, what we can take on our um, landing and, and what needs to be done if it can't take certain sizes. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I think that covers everyone we have. So I'd just like to make a couple of comments. Uh, I think the um, gentleman at the table did make the mention that the SOIs have been tuned a bit already for to be specific and measurable and thus more easily and inexpensively audited, uh, which is a, a, a significant development. And I think you know the, it's tightening up, you know, the uh, and putting them into uh, relatively easily understandable and um, uh, a table of those SFIs, SOIs and make them nice and simple and we can further uh, make suggestions to that process so I think that is really good to make them understandable and uh, to the carbon credit issue uh, my maths on the uh, balance sheet is that 1.4 million uh, carbon credits uh, to show a, a total on the balance sheet of about 55 million uh, puts them at about 30 dollars, uh, and the the current price is about 50 odd dollars. But there are projections that it will rise up. So who knows when and if? But you know it has been you know quite a lot higher in the past, and there's an expectation in the marketplace that we've seen. I've seen reported that you know back to 70 or even beyond to. 125. So, I think in terms of hedging, um, they uh, city forests probably do need to be keeping some carbon credits in hand because the market can go either way, and uh, it's not for us. To, you know, it's quite difficult for us to uh, exercise a judgment as to what they should be doing about this and that and 
which trees they should be growing and cutting and everything else unless, it's, unless it has a general overarching um, a statement of, I suppose, philosophy from us at a higher level of governance. So, in general, uh, the, the companies, I think, as I've said earlier, have picked up, and long may that continue. So, having said that, I'll put the motion that we note the state, these statements of intent. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. Against? Against? Carried. Thank you. And moving on to... Item 9, the proposed road closures. Mr McLean will come to the table. And it says here he will speak to the report. Is that the case? Or are we going straight for questions? Thanks, Mr Mayor. Straight to questions. Straight to questions. Are there any? Happy I, to move. I see no questions. I see two people happy. Who was happy to move? Councillor... Um, <laughs> Councillor Benson Pope has moved. Councillor Walker has seconded it. Would you like to speak to it? No. Would anyone? No. In which case I'll put the motion that we resolve to close the roads as uh, listed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Item last, number 10. Pro notice of motion. Councillor Gilbert has submitted this. So, are there any, do we have questions about this? No. So, happy to second. So, moved by Councillor Gilbert, seconded by, uh, was it Councillor Mayhem that was in your original notice? Fantastic. Please speak to it, Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. Um, the ODT article yesterday covered off much of why I bought the notice of motion, which means that some of this will be a little repetitive for those that have read it. So I guess talking to the motion is actually partly for those that didn't get a chance to look the article over and partly to reiterate the reason behind the notice of motion, which is quite simply that I, along with a large and growing number of residents, want to see Dunedin become the first single-use cup-free city in New Zealand and to take it further, New Zealand to take the lead from elsewhere in the world and ban them all together. Now I had considered bringing a motion which would have called for finding a way for Dunedin to completely remove them from our lives and let the rest of the country, a country catch up to us, the city of firsts. However, the hurdle with that is that in order to remove them completely, as we have plastic bags, drawers, plastic cotton buds, etc., it requires a legislative change from central government. The Waste Minimisation Act in 2008 uh, the, declares that its purpose, part one, number three, the purpose of the Act is to encourage waste minimisation and a decrease in waste disposal in order to protect the environment from harm and provide environmental, social, economic and cultural benefits. The Waste Minimisation, Plastic and Related Products Regulations tw uh, 2022, part two, around product stewardship, says that it's purpose is to encourage and in certain circumstances require the people and organisations involved in the life of a product to share responsibility for uh, ensuring there is effective reduction, reuse, recycling or recovery of the product and managing any environmental harm arising from the product when it becomes waste. In 2019, the Office of the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor estimated that, just looking at single-use coffee cups, Kiwis go through 295 million of them each year. They also stated that uh, reuse systems such as Again Again, which is the cup that, if you're paying attention, is often in front of me, uh, Globlet, uh, Ideal Cup, all encourage and support people to adopt a practice of reuse while preventing single-use items ending up in the landfill. To ensure this kind of change, quote, spreads throughout the country, the whole community regulation, uh, the whole community regulation may be necessary. So I'm perplexed that uh, several governments over the last 15 years have failed to attend to such low-hanging fruits as the use of single-use cups in their waste minimisation initiatives. It would seem then that while we wait for the government to catch up with the will of the people and the direction of the world, the logical approach is to focus on the area we can influence, the DCC. Within the Civic Centre I know that there is much that's already been achieved with single-use cups being a rare sight, 
But with conferences and events, however, there is much room for improvement. We don't need to look too far away to find examples of what can be done at scale using reusable, recycled and recyclable cups. To Pi, Christchurch Convention Centre being the closest one that I know of. Anyone that has been to an event at the stadium will be well aware of the thousands of single-use cups that are used and litter the area after the event. My ideal is to see stadiums follow examples of stadia overseas, hence my props, that use far more stable, solid and re reusable as well as recyclable cups. These are often branded, sometimes just with the city, sometimes with the event that's being attended. And yes, there are centres like Wanaka that are progressing well down the path of removing single-use cups from their waste stream. However, I can find no cities in New Zealand that are making a similar stand. It has been suggested to me that it is too big a task for a city of our size to contemplate. I would argue that we can look overseas for comfort, where some of the smaller and arguably lesser known places are contemplating a ban. The little cities like London, Montreal and Paris, for example, are on the charge towards banning most plastic and single-use items. So too are countries like Denmark, Taiwan and France. Closer to home, we only need to peer across the ditch at places like South Australia and Queensland, which have already made strides towards removing single-use cups as part of their focus on reducing pollution. I've been in touch with the Deputy Premier of South Australia, the Honourable Susan Close, who has been at the forefront of the campaign. I got in touch to try and pick her brain on the journey that they are going through and I have been assured that when we're ready, the information and learnings from their process is available to us to learn from, be it as a city or hopefully as a country. The road to being single-use cut-free is not about shaming those who hold firm to using them. Just as there were people who thought the world would end when straws were removed or when they could no longer get a plastic bag at the supermarket, there will always be some that for various reasons, either don't understand it or think that the idea of removing single-use cups is, isn't needed, nor will be it effective. I hope that the step of asking the DCC to lead by example is the first on the way towards a single-use cup-free Dunedin, and hopefully encourages more businesses and hospitality venues in our city to make the change. There is a concern that businesses suffer by opting to go single-use cup-free. All I can tell you is that in our business, we went entirely single-use cup-free in 2021, and in that time have grown. So too have the numbers of businesses using the same system. Either we're all suffering together, or there is more to this than there is made out to be. It seems to me that until either the hospitality industry as a whole decides to opt out of the use of single-use cups, or the central government chooses to add them to the list of banned items, it is down to individuals and individual operations to show how it can be done and I'm trusting that enough councillors feel like being national leaders in this regard and support the removal of single-use cups from DCC operations. Will this make a massive impact by itself? No, probably not. But it's a good start, a good signal to the city, and an invitation of others to join the march of progress. Right, the speakers, Councillor Hulham. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I'd like to first of all acknowledge Councillor Walker on this. When I first came to Council, one of the first things that happened was that Councillor Walker went and bought us all um, single-use cups and made it very clear that he didn't want us using disposable ones. Um, <clears throat> so we certainly became very aware of that. <laughs> and he talked about the um, disadvantages of using them and the environment. And we've certainly, I've certainly heard that a lot. And sitting beside him, I hear it regularly. <laughs> so yeah, um, he has been a passionate advocate for this. And so um, it, it's, it's probably quite good that this has come, this motion is here. I have more questions than I have statements to make on this. The questions I have is, if we went ahead with this, what sort of impact would this have on businesses? I realise this is for, at the moment, the proposal is, as I understand the motion, for our um, our DCC stadium, the DVML venues. Um, but what sort of impact, if this happened, would this have on them? Um, and if this was made compulsory rather than voluntary, how would we police that? 
and um, what sort of financial impact would that have on organisations and if it went wider into businesses, what sort of financial impact would it have? Um, my other question, coming from, I'm a mother of children who went to an eco school and we had a fear where we tried to have everything um, environmentally friendly, whereas we got people to bring their own plates and take, you know, for baking and everything and all those sorts of things. And I took on the challenge, I did a um, waste audit, and I also tried to source um, uh, cups and bowls that we could use to give people to take away that were sustainable and I saw some, I couldn't get any in Dunedin at the time and I had to source some from Auckland that were biodegradable and what I discovered after spending hours ringing around trying to do this and it cost a lot of money as well is that um, uh, in our city and this may have changed so if it has I'd like to know um, you can't actually, we can't biodegrade them here. They had to be sent out of the city to be um, disposed of. So there's, it's not, while it would be great to do it, it's not actually, I believe, easy to do. And while I'm not one to be held back by barriers, I think there are quite a few steps that need to be taken before this happens. So I have concerns about saying, let's just approve doing it. Um, because I think I'd like to see an impact um, statement first on what impacts this would have on so many different things. I have more questions, as you can tell, than answers. So once I got a lot of those answers, I might be more than happy. I would probably be more than happy to carry forward with this. But yeah, in the meantime, I will sit and listen to Councillor Walker's words of warning of using a single cup. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm in total support of this. We are the a city of first, as well as the the um, being very proud of our status as New Zealand's wildlife capital. And I do want to point out that um, a couple of weeks ago, a 10-day-old albatross chick died for ing ing from ingesting plastic, and this was the first one in the history of the um, the colony that had died at 10 days old because of this. And at the colony, um, when I was working there, we actually went single-use cut-free in around 2018, 2019, because it was and, and stopped selling things in plastic bottles as well because to us it was totally immoral to be selling plastic to be just, just just the waste going into the streams we would spend a lot of time cleaning up the beaches around single use cups all sorts of plastic and rubbish so I'm very very keen that we get rid of single use cups uh, we did it down at the albatross colony some occasionally people complain, but really driving all the way out to the albatross to get takeaway coffee, and it's much more civilised to sit and have a cup of tea and actually talk to the people that you're with. Um, the takeaway thing is something that has happened, I guess, in the last few decades, and it's, you know, I think we need to look back to the future about our use of um, single-use cups. I certainly don't get takeaway coffees for those very reasons and support cup libraries wherever they are. We um, didn't serve tea or coffee last week at a meeting that I was at because I couldn't see a way that we could not have um, disposable cups. So I'm, I'm very keen to um, commit this. It also aligns with our, our waste minimisation goals, which we have to be very serious about as well. The impacts on the customers and businesses, actually in some cases at businesses you can save money because you're not buying disposable cups. You're not getting rid of disposable cups. You're not paying for the waste to be taken away. Um, it's very interesting when you look at the actual cost of disposable disposable cups versus the cost of actually using the inventory that you have. And also the customer satisfaction was huge as well because people totally respected us for actually being committed to our ideals. And I go back to the, the status as the wildlife capital of New Zealand. We should be doing no harm to the um, environment around us. So I support all four, oh wait, there's one, two, and then one, two, three, four. And the, um, oh, they're renumbered now. Thank you. <laughs> I support all of the motion um, thoroughly and hope that other councillors support it as well so we can um, retain our status as a, as a city of first and a leader in waste minimisation and looking after nature. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Lucas. <clears throat> thank you. Um, and thank you, Councillor Gilbert, for bringing this motion. And I think. 
possibly five years ago um, in my involvement with the Otago Farmers Market, I came and spoke at an annual plan hearing to this very council and, and suggested that we took the lead and become single-use cup free and I think that fell on deaf ears at that time. So thank you for bringing this motion forward. And it's interestingly, um, for those of you who have been to the Otago Farmers Market, will have seen the, the big stack of single-use cups that we purposely take outside of the rubbish bins and show people the huge number. And that, without that rubbish, I mean, we, the market actually produces basically no rubbish whatsoever, apart from this huge pile of cups. They do not break down in five minutes. They're plastic lined and they take forever. And um, the market does have the again again cups and has a huge cup library. And we're currently looking at piloting the plan of making the market totally single use cup free, independently of, of this motion of Councillor Gilbert's. Um, and I just think if places like uh, events like Rhythm and Alps can do a cool single use cup that has obviously survived my teenage son's um, very uh, fun three days and I think you know it's something that our venue should be looking into and I just think that it's it's time as as um, was mentioned about um, Wanaka it's very much community led and it's a it's a voluntary thing that happens in Wanaka and you you at just about every cafe in Wanaka you have to have your takeaway cup to be able you know with you to be able to get a coffee or else you buy one um, and I just think that's something and it's become a voluntary thing I think a single use cup is something like 60 or 70 cents each that is a cost to the business to purchase you don't get a um, uh, premium paid on your coffee because you're taking it away and, and maybe long term we might not see increases in coffee and I just think it's it's um, you know we should be taking the lead on this and um, and thank you Councillor Gilbert for bringing this to Council. Councillor Wiley. Um, I sort of uh, wondered about this when Councillor Gilbert brought it to my attention and I thought, well, first off, I'm probably one of the biggest consumers of single-use cups in this room. And, um, but actually, in the last few months, I've actually been able to move away from them. And um, you haven't seen one on this table for probably this year, actually, I think. Um, so when I started looking at this and, and diving into it a little bit deeper, the first thing was, I'm actually glad that Councillor Gilbert's brought it to the table because if anybody who's got experience in the food industry and has all the connections with the cafes and the businesses around town, he does. And I think that is a big asset to have. And that's what actually makes this council table quite unique in the sense of the diverse skills that we all bring to the table. <coughs> Councillor Walker, trust me, I've been wrapped over the knuckles more than a few times from him for having my disposable cup in the past. So um, it, it gradually did sink in um, on that basis. But probably more so when I look at this notice of motion, I look at the fact that actually it's not saying tomorrow we want to ban all single cups. There's a process and a pathway to go through this. And I look at that and I go, actually, that makes sense. So that's why I will support it. Personally, I would like to add a, a, a little thing to it. Can we get the government to put 10 cents on recycling glass bottles? Because that would actually send a lot of money uh, through our economy here in Dunedin. And actually, uh, especially the beer cans and the beer bottles being recycled rather than dumped on our streets. And the, um, the last part is actually when we look at making an impact on this there is actually great marketing opportunities and I think that's the other part as both Councillor Gilbert and Councillor and Deputy Mayor Lucas have held up their um, containers vessels that have come from events and places uh, it is they are unique and they actually are become collectors items so um, thank you thank you Councillor Malley Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think the first part of um, giving up single cup use is to admit that you are a user. <laughs> 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 um, 
I, 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 you know, Councillor Gilbert, I do thank you for bringing this. I think this is actually something that we have wanted to do and, and really just haven't got around to actually putting the notice of motion up and actually doing the instruction. So it's good that it sits here now. Um, you mentioned cities like London and Paris. Of course, they have different authorities over controls than we do. And ultimately, if this is to come out, it will involve the central government to um, to be actually the comp the organise you know the entity that actually says single use cups will be banned in the same way they banned single use bags. Um, but often that requires the activities of cities to lead and then the government feels more confident to follow. So doing this I think is a very important thing. Um, it is a relatively narrow notice of motion to be honest because it effectively focuses on our activities, the Dunedin City Council's activities. It's not forcing or instructing businesses in town to do so but hopefully what they will do is they'll see that in fact it wasn't the end of the world for us and that in fact the people will get more and more used to not using them. I, um, in my car I have shopping bags and I have go cups. Um, I I think I've drunk like two cups of coffee in the last two years and that's only because they were handed to me and they were already in my hand by the time I realised they were single use cups. I don't use them at all it, and if it, if it comes down to using it or not using it I'll just not have the coffee. And I think that is something becoming more and more common and again um, I think we should be leading on this. Um, a biodegradable cup is still a single use cup. We're talking about getting rid of all single use cups. And the um, Last thing is obviously this can be something that can be used in our waste minimisation and management plan and, and be, it should, part A will probably be able to leaf it into the plan and I would like to see it sitting in there as well. So I thank you very much and I will definitely be voting yes on this. Councillor Weatherall. Thank you Mr Mayor. Uh, I admire Councillor Gilbert's best of intentions for this motion. But I question who is going to police this. Surely it should be left to personal choice. The banning of single-use cups should be driven by the hospitality sector, not individuals such as councillors, in my view. It is up to the industry and retailers to drive such a ban if they see fit, which would effectively remove any chance of spontaneous purchases, which I believe would hugely impact turnover within an industry which is already clearly struggling. If there are retailers that re wish to remove the use of single-use cups, they are perfectly free to do so. The public will ultimately decide if they share their view or choose to take their business elsewhere. I also believe Council's energy should, is better served to concentrate on our recycling initiatives opposed to removing public choice. I will not be supporting this motion. Councillor Walker. Walker. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, yeah, firstly, um, I don't apologize. Actually, I, usually I would apologize. I don't apologize to anyone for all my nagging over the years. So no expectation there. And Councillor Wiley, just to, to note, I actually was in the hospitality industry for quite a long time, but un unlike uh, Councillor Gilbert was wise enough to get out of it. <laughs> Um, and Councillor Lucas, thanks for reminding me actually of one, one of the last pieces of bad behaviour at the farmer's market, which is, um, is, is an ongoing problem. Um, and I think others have mentioned it. One of the weaknesses I find of, with notice of motions is the inability to ask, to ask questions beforehand uh, other than getting you to answer them in right reply. So I'll just throw a few your way. Um, first one would be, isn't this, this building, DPAG, already in essence a suck-free zone? Um, apart, of course, from the, the, the ongoing misdemeanors of some, 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 some in this very chamber. And, um, and I think others have alluded to this. The second question would be, how do we police, for example, the Civic Centre for anyone entering the building with a beverage of their choice, which is, is, is their choice? It's a genuine question. And, of course, my final question would be, without throwing anybody under the bus, because um, I think... Um, 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 Councillor O'Malley alluded to it, the, the admit, admitting your problem is, 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 is a go. Um, wouldn't a conversation with um, elected members around this table and actually some council staff who regularly sit in this chamber with us be a better starting point if we are going to truly send out a message to the wider public about, about um, getting our, our behaviour in order first of all? Um, moving on, I mean, when it comes to me, of course, you are largely preaching to the converted on this topic. Um, but that said, I firmly believe that the pervasive use of single cups 
in society is not a is not a cause of of environmental de degradation in and of itself, but rather a symptom of a symptom of a far greater and wider problem. And although I'll be supporting this, um, I'd be way more comfortable with, a, I guess, a wider motion that not only seeks to reduce our own consumption of single-use cups and single-use plastic in general, but that also mobilizes um, us against a system that promotes the great tide of, ju of junk around this planet in the first place. Fishing industry and building industry take note. And, and I'll steal some of Councillor Lofiso's um, thunder in her absence, actually, by pointing out that this means fighting corporate power, um, changing political <coughs> outcomes, and challenging the very growth-based growth um, world-consuming system that we all exist in, and she'd refer to, as we all know, and, and understand as capitalism. Um, it's also important, I think, for us not to lose lose focus and to remember um, that our real environmental driver where we can make real and systematic sy systemic change is, is via our zero carbon plan and our waste minimization plan. So I support reminding ourselves of the very first part of, 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 this, um, of, of this motion. Um, strange to me also, and this I always bring this up, that amidst, amidst our environmental concerns um, that little, in fact, that little, in fact, no weight is often given in discussions around this to the medical effects of single use cups as part of a lifetime um, intake of single, single, uh, oh, sorry, of micro microplastics. And, and I think we've all read articles on this well, the, the, the well documented effects therein. Um, even so-called eco-friendly cups that tried to sort of blindside us are still coated with a thin layer of plastic, um, which scientists and researchers across the planet have, planet have noted uh, that the ill effects of leaching chemicals can, can harm not only um, the environment from nematodes right up to other uh, larger creatures, but of course, uh, humans who regularly drink out of them and that would be my my message to those people who continue to use single-use cups it's affecting your health um, and finally um, well once again noting that i will support this it's worth also remembering i think in the current political climate and the cost of living uh, crisis that fighting against what is at five dollars plus a pop at the moment is a luxury item for most, um, is it, for a lot of people, is the least of their worries. Um, putting food on the table, clothing their kids, not losing their jobs and paying their electric bills and mortgages is, 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 is a greater priority for most. And that may be to some, in some, to some people, what about ism, but all the same as a, gre a grim, harsh reality. Um, and with regard to the last part of the motion, I'll be very quick here. Good luck. Um, we are talking about a government that in the first 100 days has pretty much dismantled the environmental zero waste, zero carbon scaffolding built up over previous years. So it's likely to laugh away this suggestion before it even gets to the, the bottom steps of the parliament building. Thank you. Councillor Mayhem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and especially thanks to Councillor Gilbert. I'm more than happy to second this. It's my wearing my Keep Dunedin beautiful hat, as this is something we have tried over many years to uh, work in collaboration with single use cup group, uh, uh, remove single use cup use across the city. 295 million single use cups per year. That is a scary statistic. And let's strengthen our commitment to net zero carbon by 2030. We have to start somewhere, and single-use cups is a very good place to start. New Zealand is one of the world's most wasteful countries. We are in a climate emergency, and this is avoidable waste. It, yes, it will require a collaborative effort. But it takes a lot of fuel to produce one single-use coffee cup. That will take billions of years to replenish. A reusable cup, on the other hand, can reduce our emissions by 37 to 47 per cent, save freshwater waste by 68 to 85 per cent, and reduce wasted cups in the landfill by 90 per cent. The paper coffee cup is a toxic nightmare, coated in plastic and completely unrecyclable. 
let's be role models, let's lead by example. I'm puzzled by anybody who questions this. There are so many wins. Let's make it cool. Get a reusable cup today. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm long in the truth enough to remember plastic bags being introduced. I can remember a conversation with my grandmother and how exciting it was to have a boron bag, um, which was around the petroleum industry. Uh, and look where we are today and the damage done. Um, and it's all around changing behaviour. I can remember when it wasn't cool to take uh, reusable bags into the supermarket, you just didn't do it and now it's part of what we do. The changing behaviour can take some time um, and I think this time has come so thank you Councillor Gilbert. I want to acknowledge though back in my first trainium here uh, or prior to my first uh, trainium here I remember going on a um, a boat trip, a whale watching trip off Kaikoura and the staff talking about the impact on marine life of plastic in particular and being really shocked and confused as to why the hell this city wasn't plastic free in terms of single use bags at that time. Roll on my first trainium and Councillor Wilson was the one that um, was our moral compass in this regard. And then Councillor Walker, and I love my keep cup that he gave us all, it's my favourite, you do have favourite keep cups. Um, and so uh, every time, any time I've been tempted because of situation to bring a, a, a something that isn't a keep cup, a single use cup, I have uh, resisted the temptation. Um, one of the um, issues is around the different schemes for keep cups and that has been a problem and I, and I believe that if we model this that will help to support uh, the keep cup schemes. We've seen the growth of cup libraries in all sorts of situations. Um, and, I th and I believe it's the case that there's a, I've mentioned this before, a um, Chinese symbol for crisis which also means opportunity. We have the crisis of all the keep cups and here we have an opportunity, a marketing opportunity. We love being the first in the city so I take that point as well. Um, if we need to look to any models, role models, well our young people are those role models, they do this, they don't even think twice about it and my 26, nearly 27 year old um, would give me an incredibly hard time if I was to purchase a single use cup. Um, and so uh, we I believe um, should be, and I and I just address the point of um, Councillor Weatherall's point about personal choice. We're way beyond that, folks. Uh, we, our job as council is to lead the way to model uh, appropriate behaviour in this kind of matter. Bite the bullet, step up, whatever you like to call it. It's time to step up on this. We're probably late already, in fact. So I take... Um, Councillor Lucas's point about approaching council before. So I think the time is right. This is quite specific. I think it's doable. I, again, I can't ask those questions so easily, um, but I support it as a start. But it's going to take central government to legislate, as it did with single-use plastic bags. But this is a really good start. And here's an opportunity, folks. Uh, a keep cup on our desks at council meetings, Dunedin branded. There we go, and there is one. Unfortunately, it's not my favourite keep cup, that's the problem. Um, I rest my case, thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. Um, thank you. Hard to imagine there's too much more to add. I just wanted to observe that um, I think the mover and seconder and observe that um, <clears throat> this isn't about freedom of choice or you know people's um, entitlement. This is about good environmental policy and good sensible public policy. Having said that, good luck with um, item four, um, remembering that the current government is one that um, rejected uh, initiatives for single use, single use sorry, for um, um, water saving shower heads and energy saving light bulbs. That said, um, they are also able to be educated, one would hope, uh, and I think the public, um, the public sentiment will do that. 
because there's not anyone in our community uh, unable to understand the implications of the absurd um, addition to the waste stream that co we could well do without. Councillor Eckler. I'm long in the tooth, just as uh, Councillor Gary is, perhaps I'm not quite that long, but nonetheless, uh, uh, nonetheless, in the 80s, I worked for one of the breweries, and I remember very, very well when the, uh, the reusable bottles you get a refund on were gotten rid of. They were taken away. When the stubbies came out, they were all disposable, and it all came down to cost. That's where it was at. It just came down to cost. Now, has that changed? This is the situation here that we haven't had an opportunity to ask any questions. Maybe I should have, could have uh, contacted Kevin, sorry, Councillor Gilbert, uh, ahead of this meeting. But I, I thought there would be a bit more come to us here because when I look at the, the recommendations on this notice of motion, it says here what I'm looking at, there's six, but it's one, two, one, two, three, four. Have I, have I got the wrong paper there. Can anybody answer that? It's the right, um, it's just been renumbered, Councillor. So it is numbered one to six then. Thank you. A to F. A to F. A to F, that's fine. Thank you. I, I can't see the, the board that you're looking at there. It's all shiny. <clears throat> so I'm getting back to the question side of things, you know, because I want to know yeah, if we're going to put these sorts of things in place, all these recommendations in place uh, for the various uh, venues of council and so on, uh, you know, what does it mean logistically? And for businesses, what sort of impact is it going to have on them? Now, I'm not saying that I, I – and first up, I'll, I'll – how did uh, I think Councillor O'Malley put it? You know, first up, you've got to decide whether you are one of these users. And uh, I'll put my hand up and say, yeah, I am one of these users. But I don't have to be. Uh, I've made a lot of changes, just as everybody else has, as times have moved on. And I'm more than happy to uh, to, to support this in principle. But I want to know the, the finer detail. We know that, that Dunedin Airport, their biggest issue are disposable cups when it comes to wastage. And, and it's just a massive issue for them. Uh, but how does that change in, in reality? What's the, the logistical, um, uh, you know, mo moving forward? So yeah, before I can um, support this in totality, I want to know some answers to those uh, cost issues, who's gonna, who it's going to impact on, and, and, and what are the solutions? There's been some great speakers around this table here, but they obviously know a lot more about this than I do because they're all speaking for it, but not really saying what the other side of this, perhaps, debate is really saying. So... Uh, out of those six recommendations, I can say right now, I can't support the first three, but I can support uh, the second three. Thank you. Right. right. Uh, so I've got a couple of comments on this uh, because <clears throat> I'm old enough to remember the days of the bottle drive. So when I was in the Boy Scouts, we had a bottle drive and it was a great fundraiser you know, for the Scouts, and we went around. Parents had a trailer on the back, and the, the kids ran around and picked up all the bottles. Uh, and would pop into houses, and people would actually save up their bottles for the Boy Scout bottle drive, and it was a really good fundraiser for the community. And, um, of course, those bottles were washed and recycled back into the beer drinking system. Now, I see that has uh, absolute potential for this uh, multi-use cup drive. Right, so we, so people could actually save up two or three cups that they maybe purchased from a uh, venue and then sell them to some other venue uh, if there was a refund system if required and those, that venue would then put them through their washer and recycle them through their, to their clientele. I see this as a, a lot of feel-good factor for Dunedin and it's not what the motion is about primarily is not an imposition on the retailers and businesses of Dunedin but rather an imposition on council to take the lead on this and put ourselves out there and <clears throat> move away from the single use cups and have multi use cups for ourselves and for use in our venues now I was recently exposed to a 
a, a small community of about 4,000 people, and they had a single-use coffee cup, sorry, a single coffee cup in use. It was a multi-use vessel, and it could be purchased, uh, picked up at one outlet, and handed over at another outlet. It didn't matter where in the community the uh, vessel, the cup, ended up. It would just go into, uh, people would just take it into the restaurant or the cafe or wherever they were and put it through their recycling process, which was stick it in the washing machine, in the uh, dishwasher, and use it again. And so that is a very common thing, and we would have the same thing throughout the community of Dunedin. And I think there's a lot of feel-good factor in that, which would get our particular community on board relatively easy. Already there's a large number of businesses who are subscribing. So I take a lot of heart from that, and I fully expect that the um, farmers market would very much subscribe to that. And once people are in the habit of paying for that cup, they are... Uh, I have a couple of choices. So I remember some years ago walking into a cafe who's um, part of this here in Dunedin and uh, I, I normally have a, um, a in-house cup of coffee which I because I prefer to have my coffee a coffee in crockery and uh, I'm in the habit and still am in the habit of getting a cup of coffee there but this particular day I was in a hurry and needed to be driving on so I went and asked for a takeaway and he said oh yes well I can sell you this multi-use cup for you know and th this is what you need to do in order to have a takeaway coffee huh well there was not no great problem because I was parked right outside as um, you know it was a convenient area of town and I got my multi-use cup donated to the cause by Councillor Walker from the car and got my coffee that way. So, and for my sins, I should have thought to have taken it in the first instance, but luckily I was parked right outside, so I got to uh, have my multi-use cup and didn't have to buy another one because I don't I don't need two in the car, just the one. I just have to remember to use it. And it's the same with shopping bags. I'm still guilty of sometimes going into the supermarket and having to buy another bag if I you know buy more than I expect to. But uh, getting in the habit of taking our multi-use shopping bags is just part and parcel of uh, removing that very, um, very uh, wind, very uh, waste easy type of uh, plastic from our environment. So those thin plastic bags that we used to get our shopping in uh, would spread and get blown all over town and I've seen them in all manner of places blown up against fences and into the undergrowth and you know they're a bad thing to have. So having our multi-use bags is good and similarly having our multi-use cups uh, will be good. So uh, I s fully subscribe to this motion. Councillor Gilbert, the right of apply. Thank you. Right. Uh, I won't address everything but I'll try and unpack some of it. First of all, I feel the need to reiterate that the purpose of this notice of motion is not to insist on all businesses and hospitality industry uh, that they do change. It is to in, to get the DCC to lead by example, as has been pointed out. And hopefully by leading by example, we're, we're showing how it can be done and more people than there already are, but more businesses will swap over. In terms of uh, impact on businesses, in real terms, little to no impact in terms of financial. In fact, financial impact, it can be more profitable because depending on the system, so for example, this one is completely cost neutral to uh, both the business and to the, uh, in fact, profitable to, for the business and cost neutral to the customer. We, the composting and biodegradability of uh, single-use cups, uh, coffee cups specifically, as Councillor Houlihan pointed out, it uh, can't be done. That's kind of the point, um, is that it can't be done. Even those that say they are compostable or biodegradable uh, quite simply aren't, certainly not in our system. Uh, Councillor Barker, exactly, and I believe uh, Councillor O'Malley said the same thing about aligning with the waste minimisation uh, plan. I noted with interest Councillor Barker mentioning about uh, not finding an, a way of serving tea or coffee at a meeting that she held recently. I was recently at a conference in a hotel and on their 
in hotel only for conference uh, attendees, tea and coffee station. Yes, there were crockery cups, but there were also single-use coffee cups, which absolutely bewilders me. Uh, Councillor Lucas reminded us, or it was among others that reminded us, this is not a new initiative. I realise I am not the first to bring this here. I realise I'm not the first voice. Hopefully, however, I'll be the last voice to have to bring this to the council. Um, Councillor Wiley, congratulations. It does show that middle-aged dogs can learn new tricks. Well done. Uh, Councillor O'Malley, I'm not going to say this is a 12-step process, but you are right. Uh, the first step is definitely admitting that you do have a problem. Councillor Walker, there was quite a bit in there, and I'll try and do it. Yes, you're right, DPAG is more or less uh, single-use cup-free. However, there are things like the water, um, water cups, etc., for conferences and things that uh, uh, the ones that I've been to certainly have been have not been single-use cups. Um, the as for the others around the table, for example, there is sometimes nothing you can do other than a, a glare and a stare. And I can tell you that your glare and stare can be quite effective, clearly, because it has finally got through to some. Um, but hopefully, there will be a tipping point at which everything kind of goes through. Um, Councillor Mayhem, thank you for all the, the facts and figures to back, uh, back me up. Councillor Gary, you're quite right, it is modelling and leading by example. That's entirely what this is about. And uh, well, you mentioned uh, if we would want a role model, we only need to look at the younger generation. I was talking to a group of students at the university yesterday. Uh, one of them had seen the article and almost came up and gave me a hug because it was uh, such an amazing thing and she didn't understand why it hadn't already be done. She was so excited to have the DCC finally, quote, lead the way. Um, Councillor Benson Pope, you're right as well. It is about responsibility, ostensibly showing that we are responsible. And in terms of the government, I've never been afraid of a good fight for a good reason and I'm happy to stand up on any occasion and talk to any... Uh, any politician anywhere on how this is a good reason and give them direction overseas uh, in reference to Councillor Ackland's uh, airport, how it will affect them. Uh, one of their biggest things is the single-use cups. Yes, you're right. I would also argue that with McDonald's, one of their biggest issues is a single-use cup. Given in the cities I've mentioned, including in, in Vancouver in Canada, uh, McDonald's have been at the forefront of helping the switch over, so if McDonald's can do it, I'm fairly confident that the clever team out at the airport can do it. And uh, Mr Mayor, I think you summed it up beautifully by pointing out that it's actually about learning a whole new habit. It's not forgetting your, car, uh, your, your cup in the car and taking it in. So I look forward to seeing the vote and thank everybody for the support and for Councillor Mayhem for seconding. Uh, we'll take it by division. Well, uh, Councillor Eklund, do you require it to be taken in parts? Do you request it to be taken in parts, or are you happy to go yes or no? Uh, in parts, for me, please. Well, so, uh, so, yes, A, B and C versus D, E and F. Are you okay with that? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we'll take parts A, B and C now. Councillor Eklund. Aye. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor Mayhem. Yes. Can we have our microphones on, please? Although you did, Councillor Mayhem. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. Yes. Councillor Walker. Um, aye. Councillor Weatherall. No. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Aye. Carried 12 2. So parts D, E, and F now by division. Councillor Ackland. Aye. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor Mayhem. Yes. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. Yes. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Weatherall. No. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Aye. 
carried 13-1. And I've turned the page and there's nothing there. Must be time to go home. Thank you all and uh, well done. You have the gift of an afternoon.